judge against instead of just you know out there without having some parameters put around it. So I just want to let you know um, uh, we we fully expect to have continuing adjustments as we work through this. Uh, that's the first thing. Second thing, uh, and I'll, I'll uh, mention this again in the formal session. Uh, uh, we've been working to say exactly, give some parameters not only to the board but to the public and how we're going to move forward under uh, what we discussed yesterday in regard to 66 proc uh, procurement and financing options. So uh, at the formal session, I'll, I'll make an announcement as to how that's going to happen and how you can expect to have input into that. So a couple things there, um, and what we will do today is we're going to have to break at 10. I'm hoping we'll be close to being done, if not, but at, at 10 we will break um, to move into public comment. So if we're not done the, this session, I'll suspend it, move into formal session, have public comment, we'll do the action items, uh, and then if we have to, we'll come back into this to finalize a couple of things. So that's the plan for today. Um, and with that, we'll turn it back over to Mr. Donahue, and we'll continue on with uh, House Bill 2. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Good morning. I'm going to pick up where we left off yesterday on the House Bill 2 presentation. As you remember, we've walked through a few of the different metrics and exactly how we've scored them. We have three of those left. And so we have accessibility, economic development, and the land use factors. And then the last thing we have is the overall scores. And really walking through, you know, looking at those based on raw score, relative score with total cost, and the relative score with the House Bill 2 eligible cost. So in accessibility, there were three things that were examined in the pilot scoring. First was the uh, cumulative increase in access to jobs. Uh, the second was the cumulative increase in access to jobs for disadvantaged populations. And the final was access to travel options. With all of these projects, what we have been using is a GIS tool that we developed specifically for the House Bill 2 process that has an input of where the location of all jobs and residents are today within a given region. It breaks the region up into zones, and then we map the existing transportation network and look about how far can someone travel and how many jobs can they reach within a 45-minute period. We then add the improvement into that GIS tool and see how that changes the number of jobs or the distance that can be traveled and look at what is the cumulative benefit or change and increase that takes place for one of those projects. Um, we're still working on this tool. Um, we're going to need to spend some additional probably resources to make it streamlined to get it to work a little faster and to make it more nimble than where it is today, but it's been a pretty helpful tool and has you know, been eye-opening as we've looked at the results. And so again, just to kind of walk you through it, pretend this is you know a region here and we've cut it up into 15 zones. For what the tool does is when they're without the project, it looks at zone one and it sees goes to each and every other zone and figures out how far can you go and how many jobs are in those zones and can you get there in 45 minutes. And once it does that for one zone, it then moves to the next zone and does the exact same tool, which gives you kind of the cumulative access to jobs within the region without the project. One thing I should note is you kind of see travel from uh, block zone two to zone one. That's probably a pretty short trip, and it gives higher credit for those shorter trips than it does for a longer trip, because most people are willing, you know, 100% of people will make a five minute, 10 minute drive. Maybe not 100% of people will make a 45 minute, 60 minute drive, and so you get less credit the further away a particular job is under this tool. Uh, then it goes through all the other blocks and does the same thing and gives you that kind of cumulative access for the region. Then what we do is, after you've analyzed that, you look at, in the blue here is what you could reach without the improvement. That red is kind of the extra jobs and zones that can be reached uh, in this region because that improvement has been made to the overall network. And again, you go zone by zone and do that, and then do it through all the zones. And what you get at the end is kind of an overall change in the cumulative access to jobs within a region. For the disadvantaged access to jobs, we do something similar. However, we focus on um, disadvantaged populations, which is defined in the pilot tool as low income, elderly, uh, minority, and then uh, you know non-English speakers. And so you kind of do the same thing that we talked about for the entire population, but really focus it in on this kind of social equity aspect to examine whether or not dis these disadvantaged populations are also benefiting with regard to access to jobs the same way the overall population as a whole is. 
Um, for the last part of the accessibility score is kind of the improved access to travel options. And under this one, we evaluate projects to see if they enhance non-SOV modal options, and they can get a point for each kind of modal option that they enhance. And then we scale the project to really understand the impact or the benefit it has by looking at the number of users that would be using that mode. And that is how we kind of calculate this last part of the accessibility score, which again is 20% of the overall accessibility score. And so if you take a look uh, here, this is the top 10 projects in the pilot scoring. Using the accessibility score, the number one project is the 15 expansion buses. Again, we talked about this project yesterday. This is a, a set of buses that are uh, building off of the existing metro network. And because they really have that synergy with the metro rail network, they have a really large number of jobs that it increases access to because it serves as kind of a last mile or two connection to some very, very dense activity centers. Um, if you move down here, you'll see kind of uh, auxiliary lanes and other things that are addressing bottlenecks on major interstate corridors. And as one might expect, really improving some of those allows people in given regions to really reach a, a larger number of jobs than they otherwise would be able to. And then um, you see just the multimodal access score. The top one there, as this is constructed today, is an improvement to an interstate that adds a general purpose lane and an HOV lane. And the reason that's the highest is there's expected to be a large number of HOV users on that facility. And that's providing a lot of access to carpooling, van pooling, and other transit opportunities. Uh, here's the bottom 10. Score and what you see is on accessibility, uh, there's a fair number of projects that be, didn't really register a large amount of benefit either in the access to jobs or in the access to travel options. And one of the things we see here is using the 45 minute window in some places, most of the jobs today can already be reached pretty easily within a 40, even 20 minute types of windows. And so while the improvement may have uh, provided a shorter route somewhere or may have reduced the overall travel time for each location, it didn't change the ability of the average worker to get to more jobs within that 45 minute window. Um, so a few things, uh, kind of observations and challenges with this is one, uh, as I said, this tool is new. Uh, it's been used in other parts of the country, but it's new here to Virginia, and we're creating this on a statewide basis. Um, and so it doesn't currently have a transit module that's functioning in it. And so when we evaluate transit projects, we're actually just capturing the benefits of taking users off the roadway network. We need to really make sure that we also capture, say, if we're improving VRE, the new number of jobs that people might be able to reach in an hour on that VRE or other transit systems. And so we're working on that. Um, the other thing is right now the amount of processing time uh, that this takes on a staff level is pretty high, and so we're going to really need to work to streamline this because, again, we, we input all of the land use for the entire state in there, and we you know, have to go by individually and change the assumptions of speed and travel for each individual project to run this tool uh, for all of them. It's similar to what you do in a long-range plan for regional models and statewide models. Um, we just need to find some ways to make it work a little faster. And then the other thing is the results do seem to have a correlation with job density. Um, and this, this plays the same way in both urban and rural areas, so just looking at the activity centers. And that would make sense if you're talking about access to jobs. Are we making it easier for someone to, say, get into downtown Salem or Roanoke, which is kind of that job density area within that region? And the same thing's kind of in northern Virginia. Are we getting access into Tyson's? Are we creating better access into the Pentagon? Things of that nature. And there's, there's just a correlation there. It was an observation the staff had. No questions? Mr. Fraylon is not here yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> so let's keep well, I was a little nervous when uh, Mr. Tucker and Mr. Julian had to go home. They have uh, pre-existing commitments. Not on the phone down there. Um, no, they got, not. They're the ones who scored this, so I got a little nervous <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> That's right. Mr. Chairman. Ah, yes, Mr. Connors. Nick, as you well know, this came up in our FAMPO meeting that you attended uh, two months, last month. Uh, any other regions have problems with this definition or? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Connors, and members of the board, what Mr. Connors is referring to is when I presented to the Fredericksburg area MPO, uh, there was a lot of concern that many folks in that region actually commute longer than 45 minutes in their car to jobs. And I think um, we did not hear that concern in other regions. But I also want to stress this isn't measuring someone's actual trip. What we're looking at is their opportunity to access jobs. 
And so even if we're not putting in improvements that might allow someone to travel, say, from Spotsylvania County all the way to K Street, which I suspect some folks in that area do, that's 100 and, you know, that's about an hour and 10 minutes even in free flow. Um, so it's significantly longer during rush hour, but even improvements on 95 will capture other parts and activity centers in the Northern Virginia area, which will help increase the cumulative access to jobs. And so I think there was a bit of a misunderstanding with some of the board members where they thought this was looking at their actual commutes, not the opportunity to access additional jobs. Because I don't think we can measure what is happening today because people change jobs and other things happen. What we need to understand is the ability to access those jobs, not what your, your commute is today because it could be very different tomorrow. And so we, that, that's not an issue that was raised in other regions. Um, uh, just want to make a comment here. A lot of these uh, measures we sometimes uh, think just in technical terms and, and you know, in terms of trying to measure something. But if you've been reading the press lately, uh, it's just been another Harvard uh, review done, uh, the actual uh, what transportation uh, options and access, how that directly correlates not only uh, to mobility in the transportation system, but upward mobility in life. In other words, so um, while we sometimes tend to think that uh, it's just uh, accessibility is something where these have real life consequences and more and more <laughs> studies are showing your, your uh, accessibility to various options. Uh, being able to is also directly tied uh, to your ability to improve or better your position, whether it's financial uh, or otherwise uh, in life. So very important that uh, we keep that in mind sometimes as we you know, frame some of these technical issues we're talking about. But that's really, at the end of the day, what we're trying to, uh, to accomplish. And I think accessibility is, is obviously... Uh, where we uh, tend to think of it, how does it connect in? It really has some very social impacts also. Mr. Secretary? Yeah, Mr. Tom. <clears throat> um, a lot of conversations that I've had has, has centered around using um, percentage increase <laughs> as opposed to at the absolute numbers of jobs. And I wonder if you could speak to that. Uh, yes, so Mr. Chairman, Mr. Tongta, the other, I think, comment we heard on the accessibility, the, there was the issue raised by FAMPO. There was also the issue of central destinations, which we've removed due to kind of the uh, subjectivity of that definition. The other thing that has uh, been raised most prevalently in this area is whether we should be measuring the pure number of cumulative increase in jobs or the percentage increase in jobs and at the staff we kind of went back and did some sensitivity testing not using discrete projects but just example projects to look at what that could mean we ultimately did not think that was an appropriate recommendation to the board because at the end of the day we're dividing by cost and again some of those projects that are more costly may have the same percentage increase to jobs as a less costly project but it could also be four times as many Raw, in the raw number. And so we wanted to create something that we thought was a fair analysis. And so we're scared the percentages might create a bias towards smaller projects uh, compared to uh, kind of something that looks at the overall increase dividing by cost. Um, but that, that is something, uh, members of the board, we have heard. Uh, I think we heard it from the Culpeper region, and we also, I believe, heard it from the Petersburg uh, area, if I recall correctly. Okay, I move on. The next factor area is the economic development, um, and I do want to say this has been one of the toughest um, areas to crack. And you know, based on the discussion yesterday on reliability, uh, we're going to you know again look for any additional feedback in the coming weeks. But we're going to, unless we hear otherwise, we're probably going to work to try and incorporate that into this with probably a proposed weighting of 60 percent for the square footage of development, 20 percent for this intermodal access, and then 20 percent for reliability. So again, I just I want to remind the board that was not used in the pilot testing because we were developing that reliability measure when we uh, put in place the pilot testing, but you probably will see that change in the final version of this factor area. So the square footage of development supported uh, has been the thing where we've gotten the widest range of responses as we tried to do the pilot scoring, and it was the area where we really think we need have the most work to do in tightening up the definitions. As I talked about yesterday, when we got local input from a lot of the folks looking at what is the type of growth that's submitted, we had some people that did very kind of detailed analysis and looked at the sites that were directly accessed and only counted square footage on those 
sites. And then we had other people that drew a five mile buffer and went in and counted every undeveloped parcel and the maximum allowable zoning and said, we're going to create this much economic development, whether or not the improvement actually was going to create any real growth there. And so we've really tried to kind of tighten this up. And what we're going to be doing is looking at how far along proposed developments within the project area are moving forward. And again, this can be a new site, an expansion of an existing site, or redevelopment of a currently underutilized site and the further along you are, the more points you get. So you'll get a point if you're consistent and referenced in the local comprehensive and economic development strategy there. Um, you'll get another point if you're consistent with a regional economic development strategy. Most PDCs develop these, as do some of the MPOs, and so we'll be looking both at those. Is this something that's actually talked about? Are, are you talking about attracting this type of industry in your regional economic development plans or not? And if you are, you'll get more points along because it's consistent with the broader planning that's been done in that region. Oh, Mr. Casper, thank you. Sorry. A question on when we talk about square footage that these projects support. Are we talking about commercial, retail, residential combined? Commercial, industrial, how is that broken out? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Kaskowitz, it's essentially everything excluding residential okay. development, uh, and I, I think institutional is probably not considered as well, um, but that is spelled out in detail in the appendices. But it's basically job-producing development, not the housing where the people might be. Uh, then we'll also give you points as to whether or not the sites that where the development might be located, how far along is it? So. Does the comp plan or zoning call for this type of development on that site? Um, is there a site plan pending or approved for that site? And are there utilities either programmed or in place on that site? And they can get a maximum of up to five points. And then for each site, those points are going to be scaled based on a set of factors. And these factors really came, uh, the need for these came out in the pilot scoring. And so we're going to scale it based on whether or not the project provides direct access to the proposed site. So in some of the pilot scorings, we had it, one example was an interstate widening. The interstate itself, we were widening between two interchanges, and there probably was not a lot of direct economic development that was happening because of just that widening. But within a mile, there was a primary roadway that for a long time has been a major commercial corridor with a lot of planned office space and other development that was coming online regardless of whether or not that facility was put in place, and so we really need to try and distinguish whether or not the improvements are directly enhancing the access, or if there just happens to be growth that's proximate to this improvement that might benefit from it. And so again, direct access would get 100% of the square footage benefits, while indirect access would only receive 50%. The other thing that we saw in the pilot scoring is again, people were, some people looked very narrowly, and some people looked out as far as five miles. And we really don't think that projects five miles away are receiving the same type of benefit as projects within a mile. And so once we've done the scaling based on direct access or indirect access, we'll divide that square footage by the number of miles it is away. And so if it's within a mile, you'll get full credit. And then for each mile moving away, that will reduce by the you know, number of miles that it is. So if something's five miles away and it's 100 square feet, we divide that by five and say you're only getting credit for 20 square footage because that improvement is so far away from this develop from this improvement, excuse me. Mr. Jay, yes, Mr. Uh, Fraylon. Um, Nick, it seems to me that makes a lot of sense for secondary, maybe primary improvements. But you brought up the interstate, and it sounds to me like, you know, a new, uh, a new six miles of interstate could have an economic development impact for 30 miles. You know, if, if like I'm thinking about a mega project kind of thing and how they would score on this, and it may be that they wouldn't be. That, I'm thinking about a new a new road, uh, yes, say finish the smart road or 73 or something like that. How would they score on something? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Freeland, I don't know the specifics of those roads, so I can't respond to how they might score. What I would say is this is the area that was, has been the toughest for staff since the very beginning. Right. It's still the area where the staff are the least comfortable <clears throat> with what we propose. I think the really tough thing is on the rest of these, we can draw correlation. We can draw some causality between them, safety, congestion, accessibility. We can really kind of 
quantify some of those and with confidence say this improvement resulted in this change. On economic development, that's it's very tough. There's a whole host of other factors that go into that, and I think our concern, while I agree with you that, say, a new interstate or a widening of an interstate for six miles in particular area is going to probably have economic competitiveness benefits for a region well beyond this five-mile buffer that we're allowing things to be considered. The real question is where do we draw the line and how do we draw that? And I think a lot of the other scoring factors will try and capture that competitiveness aspects. We are really trying to focus on where we can draw distinctions that this improvement likely resulted in some of this growth taking place in this area. One of the things we heard from our peer workshop, remember last um, November and September, we brought in folks from across the country who have done these types of exercises. They said economic development is the toughest because it's really just hard to make that link. And the thing they said is don't give credit to people if they just say widen this road and something great will happen. You need to make people demonstrate that they've thought through this process and they know widening this road is going to help me have this development in this site. This development is going to be this type of industry. They may not know the company, but they have a strategy that they're trying to enhance that they can demonstrate this project plays a role in because that keeps this process a bit more honest. That probably will miss some benefits, uh, Mr. Fralin, but I think from a staff's perspective, we needed some way of being able to say there's a relationship between the improvement and the development that took place. And, and I agree with that. I, I understand the fine line that you have to, I mean, it's a little bit of a Potter Stewart kind of situation, you know, you know when you see it. <laughs> it's hard to define it. How much discretion is in this score? I mean, it doesn't look like there's a lot of discretion on the staff's part to give to award points for something that is this um, is just a mathematical form. There's no, Mr. Chair, Mr. There's a lot of local input that will go into this measure, and so we're going to be looking to the locals to really identify those sites, show us the regional economic development strategy, the local economic development strategy, and kind of demonstrate how it is consistent or referenced within that. And so there is probably not a lot of staff discretion, but there's some local and regional discretion that exists within this metric. Thank you. You know, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just thinking yesterday, uh, uh, and we formally thanked uh, Scott, uh, Mr. Casperitz, for the flyovers of the Northern Virginia District yesterday and looking at it. But when I was, uh, we had a lot of discussion uh, individually in the in the copters or helicopter. But when you look at when your comment about uh, you know the economic development of widening a road and compare that to the congestion mitigation of the road. In other words, they're not always compatible. If you want to, you know, and, and that's what was concerning me a little bit, if we just put a, all our eggs in one basket on a measure, and I'm just throwing this you know, on a measure, um, you know, we may not capture exactly what you're talking about. In other words, that, you know, look, uh, yes, we want to widen this, we want to connect A to B, but if we don't generate economic development or opportunities between A to B, you know, have we really accomplished what we're doing? So, I, uh, uh, in your comments, you're right. If you put a, you know, a mega site in and it, 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 you know, you improve the interstate for three or four miles, you probably draw from 30, 40 miles away. I mean, in terms of that. So, I just uh, point out that a lot of these tools, and I, yeah, I'm not suggesting there shouldn't be emphasis, but um, the score one well in one may not help you score well in another. Is all in, in that regard. So, I think it gets back to what is we want to build the roads for, uh, and. Uh, um, and, and I think most of the time it's just more than one measure. Now I'm not downplaying the, the poor. Please, I'm not like Mr. Garcia. I'm not downplaying. I think I mean I certainly see the congestion issues in in Northern Virginia, no doubt. But I just call, I just caution that uh, um, that uh, if, when we do one thing to the mutual exclusion of others, it may not be the results that we want. And and uh, Mr. Freeland, we mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, what we're going to do after this uh, presentation um, and uh, work uh, next month, you will actually be adopting the, uh, just to make clear again, that's not the final. I think uh, what we'll do is when we get actual projects to score, we're going to have a workshop and we can sit down and actually see what these things do instead of having 
uh, these discussions, and I, I'm not instead of, in, uh, in addition to having these discussions, because I think that's when we can really see how these measures are going to impact and did we get it. So just throw that comment out uh, as to, I think the real value will be when we score these and see how we compare. Ms. Valentine, you had something you want to talk about. Um, I, yes, thank you. In our work session in Lynchburg, one of the concerns that came up about square footage was expansion versus new development. Because sometimes with expansion, because you have a, an existing business, they have the cafeteria, the boardroom, the, they have a lot of the infrastructure in place, but an expansion can actually create a large number of jobs. And so they may not be able to compete fairly if we're just looking at square footage. And I just didn't know if that had been considered in this. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Fountain, that is one of the things we really struggled with on this metric is, again, we needed something we thought to scale it by since we'll be dividing by the cost to make sure there's no biases between small, large, or medium-sized projects. And everywhere we went, we kind of we really talked to people, should we be using jobs? Should we be using square footage? Uh, should we be using, you know, the uh, expected private investment? And we basically could not, there was no consensus statewide. And in many areas, they said, well, you tell us. We're not sure what it should be. We, we kind of defer to you all. And so we, the kind of, we did look at jobs, which was going to be a way of doing that, mm -hmm. kind of taking into account the fact that in some instances, square footage might not be the best proxy for what's taking place. And there's that change there. But we just couldn't come up with a way where, particularly when you have a site that's going to come online and has not yet, or is earlier in the development process, we can't quantify what the jobs are, and we didn't want to end up in a place where we had to put a burden on the local government, where they had to actually have a company in hand who would tell them a number of jobs before we would be willing to count that as an economic benefit. So I think one of the, we, we did not resolve that issue, but I think one of the things that we can look at doing in the future is maybe we can put an other column in the kind of uh, information that localities provide to us, because as the secretary said, this is a tool for the board. You're not required to score it down there, so maybe we can kind of have, you know, other comments you'd like to provide to the board for consideration. They can say, this is, you know, there's a lot of expansion here. We expect a high number of jobs, even though our square footage is low, or other things of that nature, so we can provide that to you all um, as we move forward. But we couldn't figure out a way to work that into the overall scoring process just because it's, it proved to be too difficult to quantify jobs. And that's a really good point uh, because, the, you know, again, um, you make the decision and you get the score. You're not going to say, well, I think that's better. I'm going to send it back to score. You make a comment and the law just says, tell us why you chose to do this. You know, so I want to make that point out too. you know, you know, there are some, though, I will point out to infer. And I think the law does infer that we want to try to use this measure. I, not try. We're going to use this measure. But it shouldn't take away your overall judgment as long as we disclose why in our judgment we decided to do it. No, that's fully what the intent is. Right. Well, I appreciate the clarification, but I just thought it was a very interesting point yeah. when we're trying to determine the impact. Oh, Mr. Dixon. I mean, <laughs> Ms. Whitworth, excuse me. Sorry. Um, I recall yesterday your preceding comments talking about don't try to draw conclusions of how this scoring uh, will or might affect various classes. Uh, and I understand now why you made those statements because I, I did do a little analysis of, uh, of the five categories. Uh, more specifically, looking at the rural areas of C and D categories. Um, and to no surprise, I guess, uh, the C and D categories uh, pervasively uh, dominated the bottom ten samples that you used. Now, uh, I don't know what the C and D categories did in the lower half versus the upper half, but I do think that we need, as we look at making those independent decisions that the Secretary talked about, we do need to understand that as, as much as we're trying to make this a, not a biased matrix, it is biased. It has to be because of the very nature 
uh, of the things we're measuring. For instance, uh, in, in congestion, there are only two that are C and D that are in the top ten. In safety, there are only there are six. In, in accessibility, there are zero. Um, in economic development, there are five, and in environmental, there are six. But if you, I mean, there are three. But if you look on the bottom ten, those numbers are are vastly larger. And there are all these are projects that have been done, approved, and I suspect in those areas are very important projects to those specific areas. So this is the danger of trying to weigh importance with a mathematical uh, matrix that we're required to do. But my point is we need to keep this in mind as these new new projects come forward, uh, there will be a need for, for for advocates around the table to explain why if, if this project is in, uh, doesn't score well, it's an important project to those districts to, that we represent. Well, I point out, I think that, that's why 1887 came in. Half the monies go directly now to the districts. They're only competing within the district. And I suspect that this board at the state level are going to really be charged with those major projects, you know, that connect regions. I'm not saying that's the, but I think that's the way things are going to come down. And that was the reason why we wanted to make sure monies went right to districts. Exactly. So they're only competing. So, so yes, thank you. At the end of the day, House Bill 2, on a statewide basis, only impacts 27.5% of all the construction monies each year. That's 45% go right to, for good state of good repair to the districts, and the other 27.5% goes to the districts. So I want to just, you got to keep putting that in context. I mean, we're talking about less than 30% of the money, which probably is going to be, you know, these bigger projects are going to score pretty daggone high, I would guess. And, 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 and we are charged with a statewide connectivity. I'm not suggesting that right now, but that's probably the way they're going to call, fall down. We're going to need two, three, four million dollars at a pop for some of these larger projects. So. And I think that's key. That is still our job. Our job is not to fund just every project in every district. And I, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I mean, I, that, that, but I think we, we recognize that because that's why the money goes to 27.5%, half of it goes there. Our job is to make sure we have a statewide transportation network. So just just throw that out. And, and so y y you're right. If everything, if we hadn't done 1887, I think exactly, I mean, that, that's what I was, I think we could have devolved it. It's back to how do we finagle, let's get money to the district. We're really now, as a district representative, uh, and at large, you now have monies at the district, and you're getting competing against those projects within your district that are similar scoring the whole bit, and you get to make those decisions. So in that, but so I think, uh, I think uh, 1887 really was, if you need it, we heard that loud and clear when we went around the Commonwealth loud and clear so but at the end of the day we really are talking about we're talking 27 and a half percent of all our construction monies that will be if you want to put a project will be competed statewide and my guess is the larger project is going to rise to the top simply because of the very nature of, of them Jeremy. Yes, Mr. Uh, in response to Mr. Dixon, yeah. Mr. <laughs> that's my fault. Yeah, you got uh, too much bourbon. <laughs> that's right. uh, we won't go there. Nah, um, I think it, we still have the prerogative on this board uh, to advocate and to make decisions that aren't necessarily always strictly tied in to the objective analysis. Uh, because if you start to go completely the objective analysis, why are we sitting here? Right. Exactly. It's, it's exactly. really for us to make the case uh, for a particular project and sometimes recognize that it might have scored low, but in the, in the analysis of the whole Commonwealth, it's still important to that district. And we have to respect and recognize that amongst each other. So I hope that's never taken away. And I don't think the intent of this law is to just make this totally objective. Right. Now, I understand everything said. I was simply laying the bed no. uh, that 
My friend from Bristol here is going to have to be a good advocate. Well, Chairman, yes, I Matt. think we could also say that Mr. Category C and D make up about 80 percent of the land mass in the state of Virginia. Yeah. And Mr. Chairman, if I could add also, these top 10 scores you're seeing in each section are the raw scores. So yeah. I believe yesterday Mr. Tucker made reference to there was a project that was in the bottom 10 on a particular category. When we get to the end here, you're going to see it in the top 10 overall. Yeah. And so remember, that's just the aggregate benefit. It's not the benefit for the dollar spent. And I think when we get to these last few slides here, Mr. Dick, uh, Mr. Whitworth, sorry. <laughs> okay, really? Um, you'll see, uh, you may not see the same dynamic play out as we look at the, the tops and the bottoms of the uh, you know overall scores, looking at the relative and HP2 cost. Okay, continue on, Mr. Uh, the oh, next yeah. uh, section of the economic development factor area is the intermodal access, and again, this is currently weighted at 30 percent, though we're going to move that down to 20 as we move reliability into this metric. And what we've done here is there's kind of three things we're examining, and it's really focused on goods movement and intermodal access. So are you improving direct access or uh, improving a facility approximate to a distribution facility, an intermodal facility, or manufacturing site? Are you improving a designated? STAA truck route, which is something that's a federal designation that kind of signifies the major truck routes uh, throughout the nation, or are you also improving kind of access around or directly to the Commonwealth's uh, aviation sites, the airports or the ports, including inland ports uh, in the Commonwealth? And then what we're going to do again is to look at when we make these improvements, scaling it based on the tonnage that is anticipated to be to benefit from that improvement. And we get a, there's a lot of different national data sources we're relying on right now to provide us that research. Uh, most would be kind of this thing called TransSearch, which is a nationally uh, provided tool that gives you the different types of tonnage by mode on given corridors uh, across the country. And so if you take a look here, you can see the top uh, 10 projects, their raw score. Um, looking at uh, economic development here, and actually the very top one is one of the ones I talked about earlier, where there's an interstate that's being widened for about, about four and a half miles, and then what's happening is there's a lot of growth on that uh, kind of parallel uh, primary roadway that is was there before, and you know this improvement does help it, but a lot of it was already kind of taking place, which again led us to go back and look at how we should revise that kind of classification. And then you see, uh, you know, kind of the top one there for the intermodal access was one that really addresses some bridges and a freight bottleneck in a more uh, rural part of the Commonwealth. It's in a Category D area. Uh, moving on to the next. Yes, Mr. Brown. So, are you saying that the score here on the top, this number, project number 11? <laughs> led you to change how we did things so this is this is no longer the top project no no we we changed it and this is still the top project okay um it was so right now again remember how everything is relative yesterday so as you see some of these other scores sure. that 52 below it prior to that modification i believe was something closer to what 20 or 25 and okay. uh mr tucker if he was here could give you the exact number i'm kind of pulling them out of thin air but that's generally what was happening and if you look over at the, uh, the next slide, you see a lot of projects. And again, some of these scored better in some of the other categories, but they didn't. They just didn't do very much either for goods movement or you know nearby economic development. As we talked about in kind of the summary slides, there's projects. There's no project that scored really high in all categories. Most projects did really well in one to two, and the, the ones that scored really high got about three. But no one did well in every category area. And we just had some projects in this 38 that did very little to facilitate new or expanded economic growth or to goods movement. Uh, so some of the challenges that we have here is, again, just really quantifying this, our lack of ability to draw the causation between the improvement and the you know economic growth that's coming in. There's also going to have to be a very, very strong quality assurance, quality control um, process in this. Right now, we had kind of district staff provide us this information, and those aren't even like the local staff who in the future might provide this. And so even when we used our own staff, we had the kind of people who were trying to say, oh, no, count this extra growth. This is really going to happen. And we suspect that when we receive applications from MPOs, PDCs, and local governments, that that issue is going to become more uh, pervasive 
And so we're just going to keep working with them to make sure that only you know growth that's benefiting from this develop uh, improvement is considered. One of the other issues that we've run into is there are some projects that may be proximate to a fair amount of new economic development but have almost no impact on that. And the example I would give you is there was a park and ride lot that was considered uh, in the pilot scoring that did relatively well under economic development. I went around and asked every member of the HP2 team, did you think this park and ride lot had any role in the economic development happening within these you know, few miles near it? And the unanimous response was no, it did not. And so we need to go back and kind of make sure that certain types of projects, particularly park and ride lots, like those do a lot for congestion. Um, they can help with accessibility. We, as staff, do not believe they have an impact on economic development nearby. We just think in this one it was just kind of a fluke of how the process was put in place and one of the lessons learned from our pilot scoring process. Uh, the other thing is we need to uh, do some work in the coming months to make sure we have all the manufacturing, intermodal, and distribution sites identified. We have a pretty comprehensive list, but uh, we think there's some gaps in it, so staff are working very hard right now using a multitude of resources to make sure we fill in those gaps before we start to score projects in the fall. Uh, uh, we have the environmental uh, factor area. Again, uh, one of the things I want to talk about before we go through this is we've changed this measure pretty dramatically in the revised construct and so right now there's only one metric that's being shown in the future there will be two there will be that impact to cultural and natural resources and so when you see this you're going to see some projects that have you know very few points because they may not have the air quality benefits but when we look at kind of the natural and cultural resources impact every project is going to get some form of points kind of moving forward from that based on the degree to which they uh, avoid or minimize impacts to cultural and natural resources so for the air quality uh, and greenhouse gas perspective, we looked at whether or not the degree which a project helps promote non-SOV travel or reduces fr uh, freight bottlenecks where there's a large amount of truck traffic. And what we defined as a large amount of truck traffic is more than 8% of traffic and a uh, kind of congested bottleneck looking at the volume to capacity types of calculations that Mr. Tucker walked through yesterday. And then what, again, we do to scale this so we can divide by cost is for the non-SOV components, we look at the amount of users, again, kind of the benefit or impact we expect the improvement to have, and for the truck bottlenecks, we look at the truck volumes as we kind of scale that to divide by the benefit. And so again, here are the top 10 uh, using this half of the environmental metric. Um, right now, the uh, park and ride lot is the number one scoring project, and that's just because there's a high number of non-SOV users as well as it has transit, carpool, as well as kind of ITS and technology improvements. And so it does a lot of things to help facilitate that non-SOV travel. Uh, if you move over to the bottom 10, we have a lot of projects that simply did not address freight bottlenecks or help promote non-SOV travel. Again, I want to stress in the future, you're not going to see a bottom 10 of all zeros when we add in that other measure because all projects will be getting points under that other measure. And so I just want to really highlight that for the board that you're not going to see this type of outcome from the environmental measure score in the future when that other uh, factor is put in there. Uh, some of the challenges uh, that we had here is just getting inputs from the applicants and making sure that they can provide that you know accurate type of information. And again, the pilot scoring did not consider the impact to natural and cultural resources. Looking at you know whether or not it was a categorical exclusion, an environmental assessment, or a full-blown EIS, and then the number of acres of impacted lands that just was not considered in this pilot because we are still developing the measure at that time based on stakeholder feedback. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, the last factor area is the land use area. Um, before we get in this, I just want to remind members of the board this is only applicable in category, uh, uh, excuse me, waiting frameworks A and B. And so again, just as a reminder, that's Northern Virginia, Fredericksburg, Richmond, Hampton Roads, Charlottesville, and the Roanoke-Salem TPO area. So those are the only areas where this metric, as currently proposed, is applicable. 
And under this metric, again, we look at really trying to quantify what is the project doing to help promote transportation efficient land use. There's been a lot of discussion in the board uh, yesterday and at past meetings about interconnected streets uh, and you know, really promoting types of development that minimize the impact on the transportation network. That's really the purpose of this kind of score here. And so if you kind of want to think about the different factor areas, congestion is really focused on dealing with the issues we have today and expect to you know, have from some of the growth that's in the pipeline. This is about having some of that future growth minimize its impact on the transportation network. So as we're trying to do, reduce congestion, when that future growth comes in, it does, doesn't just undo what we did with our congestion reducing investments. Yes, Mr. Bell. <clears throat> I'm really interested in this grid network thing, as you know. If you look at page 33 of the implementation policy guide, it says, is the project consistent with or does the project support traditional neighborhood development design components as defined in section 15.2223.1? I haven't looked that up yet. I will, but. Um, I have does, no doubt. <laughs> does that, does that, is that where we're getting at that factor? Mr. Chair, Mr. Friend, there's several ways where we're getting at that factor. That is, I think, the most direct one. That code reference uh, refers to a section of code that was added in 2007 under House Bill 3202. That is the urban development area right. section of code that talks about locally designated growth areas that have a mix of uses. Interconnected streets is actually explicitly referenced in that. Um, and so that is really where we're drawing that direct connection. I would also say looking at kind of the regional uh, VMT uh, projections from those long-range plans the regions put together will also quantify that as well as looking at kind of infill development uh, kind of moving forward. Well, Mr. Chairman, the reason I, I mean, it, it somehow goes a little bit back to the, to the uh, uh, comments that we had yesterday about whether the, in Northern Virginia, what, what percentage it ought to be is congestion. Um, and I've just read the letter from uh, Doug Minshew and the speaker and everybody else, and they want to put it at 60%. That may or may not help them score on a statewide basis. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, and, you know, they have scored pretty strongly on economic development, for example, up here. They scored pretty strongly on, on this aspect of it. And so, you know, I, I don't know, but one thing I am concerned about is if we just put all our money into congestion relief, it will just push the development further out. And if we don't hold some criteria here for development, we're going to see another set of cul-de-sacs out here west of, of Dulles, you know, all the land flew over, and we're going to be back in the same situation in 40 years. And that's the concern I have by just strict, I understand that they need congestion, but we also have to plan a little bit. Well, I, I, I was going to uh, bring this letter up at the end, uh, but, oh, now, okay. since, but now since you've mentioned it, uh, <laughs> no, no, it's fine, it's okay. Uh, and I, and I, uh, it does, the letter is addressed to me, and it's uh, from uh, Speaker Howe and, and seven or eight others uh, uh, it, uh, from this area, and, and one from Hampton Road, to thank the new uh, House of Transportation, Ron Bell and the Wave also signed uh, the letter. Um, it, it employs, it, it asks the Chalmers Board Transportation Board to strongly encourage two things. They want to uh, believe uh, in Hampton, Ro uh, Hampton Roads in Northern Virginia, uh, and specifically there's mostly from Northern Virginia, as you mentioned, congestion should be 60 percent. and. Uh, I, I agree with all wholeheartedly a lot of the concerns that you have in that regard. Uh, although Mr. Dyke and Mr. Grozinski did express opinions to move it up from the 35 percent, I think we should give consideration to that in that regard. Um, and also the second thing is, that, uh, back to the comment that Mr. Whitworth was sort of making that I responded to, is that imploring uh, or strongly recommending the Transportation Board really focus on what they consider are major projects. It's not supposed to be to take care of local roads planning. Um, I, I, I don't, I'm sure I agree with all that, uh, but I want to point out there that the letter, I'll put it in public comment, make sure you all have copies of it uh, in that uh, uh, going forward and respect uh, their, their comments. Um, 
Um, but I think House Bill 1887, again, does address some of those because, as we talked about before, it's, you know, this money's going right to this district, and they'll be, uh, uh, even though we ultimately have to approve as a CTB, the district will be making the recommendations on what project they want. So I didn't want to, I'm glad you brought it up. I was going to bring that up. I'll make sure it gets in public comment. Uh, but that is the letter uh, that uh, that they sent. Uh, we were very involved. I know Nick and I were very much in these discussions. And uh, I'm not exactly sure I agree with all the tenor, but certainly I value their input. Uh, and so well, what let, you let guys this to have. Secretary. If, if, uh, if we move the, the congestion number up, which, you know, it's fine. Um, maybe we want to move the land use number up. Uh, so, because yeah, right true. now it's yeah, at 10 yeah. or 15 or something, and maybe we need to balance those two things out a little bit. Mr. President, I think the, uh, the intent of the letter from the legislatures is uh, to try to coincide with the legislation as it was passed in the General Assembly with the concentration on congestion relief and the interpretation that 35 percent does not appear to be a concentration to those legislators who passed the bill or to the general public. Now, that's not, I'm not advocating going to 75 percent or higher than that because I think the case was made yesterday as we were flying around that uh, you know, accessibility that we've talked about and land use certainly have a place and uh, you know, deserve recognition maybe beyond some of the other factors. Uh, so yeah. that, that is what I interpret it as, as the intent. Uh, Jim could speak to that too, or Scott. I agree that we probably need to uh, focus a little bit more on land use. Now, with that number is, I think we need to talk about it. But I, I, I still think that we need to send a clear message on the congestion front. And that's why I made the comments I did yesterday. Yeah, and I, and I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I understand where it's coming from in, in that regard. I think that's absolutely right. Um, as you know, we basically are let, it, let the locals give us input for you to decide uh, in terms of how their categories and how the rankings and the whole bit. So I think this is important to, for them to weigh in, uh, in in that regard and how they understood the legislation. So that's why I wanted to make sure it was known to you and uh, everybody uh, uh, consider that as we go through these. Mr. Kasper, I'm sure we'll something? have more discussion on this, but I have to I just concur with William's point. If we overweight congestion, we just start the cycle over and over and over and end up with land use policies further out driving our need to make congestion-based decisions in the future. Uh, Mr. Connors. I will point out the speaker has been a big proponent of land use and transportation. I think 3202 came from him. So mm -hmm. I think he's asking us to strike a balance and not to go overweight one way or the other because he's been a big proponent as of last Thursday when I met with him. A big proponent of land use. Yeah, and I actually believe the balance is what's needed for the uh, not only the policy, but in terms of the the raw scoring. And that's another. That's what I was only pointing out. That's why we'll have this workshop. And Ms. Freeland made the point. I mean, yes, uh, but then again, if you do that uh, and it uh, doesn't score the project, you really want. I mean, it just he's got to consider. That, that's that's all I'm suggesting. But I did want to make this public. And everybody understand the concerns of the, the General Assembly members that uh, were supportive of House Bill 2. And actually, Speaker Howe was the patron of House Bill 2. So, Mr. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, uh, you can see here on the slide the various factors that were considered uh, using the land use score. A lot of them are focused on some of the issues that Mr. Fralin has raised. And they talk about really, are we kind of creating activity centers where development can take place in the future that will reduce the impact of that new growth on the transportation network. We're also looking at kind of regionally, as these metropolitan areas have developed their long-range transportation plans, have they done it in a way where they've been able to strike a balance between their future growth and the transportation resource they have to try and reduce per capita vehicle miles traveled. Again, 
demonstrating that they've got a better jobs to housing balance or that they've really succeeded in this kind of activity center strategy to reduce the impacts of this new growth on the transportation network. I think one of the key things um, about House Bill 2 and also with this land use aspect is even with the revenue package from 2030, uh, 2013, we're never going to have enough resources to really build or address all the needs that are out there. And so we need also trying to create uh, encouragement or incentives for some of these regional uh, areas and localities to think about ways they can accommodate their future growth in a less uh, capital intensive transportation way, kind of moving forward. We also uh, have something in here about the access management plans. And that's really a regulation that was put in place also as a part of House Bill 3202, which deals with on our major corridors, making sure we don't kind of degrade their performance by having, you know, four entrances to an Exxon at a major intersection where you have those turning movements, which causes accidents and congestion with people slowing down and speeding up. Uh, we left this in to talk about it with the board, but as we looked at the pilot scores, we're not sure this is necessarily the most appropriate measure for this place as it's kind of... You either have the plan or you don't, and right now we have a regulation that applies these plans to all the major roadways, and so it's kind of ended up being a default point provider and raising up projects that may that don't actually drive at the rest of the land use aspects of this measure. The other thing that we've done here is we've scaled this by non-SOV users, and uh, I want to say to the board that as staff, we're not sure that's actually the right thing to do this on. We just kept it with that for the pilot testing because we didn't have time to go back and examine other options, but we think it might actually be more appropriate to look at the amount of both commercial and residential development uh, in an area where this uh, improvement is serving rather than the number of people not driving. Because even in these activity centers, you're going to have driving, you're going to have walking, you may have transit usage. I don't think it's appropriate to necessarily focus on who's not in the car, but rather on the amount of growth that's happening there, because what we needed to do is have more of growth happen in areas that's less transportation uh, intensive or more efficient uh, in the way that it impacts the transportation network. So, Mr. Casper, Nick, are there other demand-based metrics that could be included in the land use uh, evaluation? So, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Kaskowitz, uh this is another measure that was tough, um, like economic development, but not for the same reasons. The really tough part with the land use metric uh, is we have a paradigm in Virginia, and for all the local government folks in the room and watching at home, we're not looking to change that. Um, but where the state controls the vast majority of transportation investments and the local governments are solely responsible for the land development patterns that the transportation network is supposed to be serving. And so we've, we've been trying to come up with ways to kind of create those types of incentives moving forward. And we think the metrics that are there are some, maybe some of the better ones that we have. Uh, I'm sure there, there may be some other ones we can come up with in the coming months, but we don't have any other, other ones today that we would recommend to the board. We really think focusing on having that kind of uh, walkable mixed use or denser types of development where appropriate um, is the right type of thing to include. And again, it's not appropriate in all places. It's really in certain nodes that are well served by transportation access, both transit and highways. Ms. Valentine. Thank you. I just want to make sure I understand what you said about the access management plans. Is Do most of our major quarters have one, have an access management plan? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Valentine, they, they don't all necessarily have individualized plans that have been developed through a discrete planning process. Some of them, like 29, do have more detailed plans, but uh, the commissioner actually has what's known as access management regulations that currently apply to all interstates, principal arterials, and I believe minor arterials throughout the Commonwealth. And so by virtue of that regulation, they're all subject to a plan and restriction. It's just some are personalized and some are not. They're just default under that regulation. So it kind of ended up being points everyone got, whether or not the project was otherwise driving towards the outcome this factor area is supposed to look at. Okay. Um, Mr. One, one more yep. before we leave land use. Um, I, I understand that VDOT uh, it gets a crack when, it, when, a, when a locality passes a comprehensive plan, VDOT gets a crack to look at it and comment, I guess, right. on it. That's correct. Um, and with this new uh, formula, I think it's the first time that land use is going to be rewarded or penalized. I mean, it's, I mean, the way we rewarded projects before, 
it was kind of looked at, but I mean, this is going to be actually analyzed under this bill, which is a good thing. Yeah. And it seems to me that VDOT would do a, a localities a service by when they look at those plans and not give them a cursory review, but actually say, if, if you pass this plan, it's not it's going to hurt you in Hospital too. When you you know mm -hmm. give an analysis of those comprehensive plans and how they're going to work with this new process, because all of a sudden they really matter. Well, they do, and, and because uh, they should not compliant with it. If they change their mind later, they're going to score really poorly on this. Well, I think this is the first time I think with this that there's actually some teeth into the VTrans process about the land use planning and stuff. Because you're right, and I think that's really some of the inherent. Uh, uh, positive things about House Bill 2, not only them, but I was at public hearings and heard from our VDOT engineers, well, that's not going to score well under House Bill 2. We can do it this way. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's exactly the, what we're looking for long term. It will change habits. I mean, now, and maybe some uh, will have to take a look at how it does, but I mean, that, that's the intent, is to really tie together. And we didn't show it here, but if we, if we did it every of uh, the transportation uh, board meeting hearings, the circle that now ties together VTRANS allocating the money and spending the money under 1887. In other words, they are interconnected. And uh, if you want your project to do well, you, you need to figure out how that they are connected. I agree 100%. Ms. Valentine. Um, are access management plans part of comprehensive plans? The, the comprehensive plans typically, they have a transportation element. Uh, they will, will guide the county in terms of where they want various types of, of development to occur and what types of transportation improvements are needed. And one of the challenges as I'm hearing this in Virginia is that the typical land use pattern in Virginia is what I call strip zoning, commercial zoning along your primary and your other major arterial corridors. And this is, you see this phenomenon all over Virginia where it's uh, U.S. route whatever you'll see these uh, uh, strip zoning 600 feet, 1,000 feet off the center line of the roadway. And it, it provides, uh, it, it makes it significantly difficult to manage that, that arterial road as a commercial development occurs. So some of the areas are really beginning to try to cluster land use in Northern Virginia, um, some areas, parts of Richmond, even parts of Hampton Roads and, and the Roanoke area. But that, that continues to be the challenge. When we talk about access management, um, if a person owns a piece of land along a primary highway and it's not limited access, ultimately they're going to get a commercial interest. How that gets configured, we have some, some uh, uh, control, but in the end we can't say you cannot have an entrance onto this roadway if, if that is your piece of land. Uh, we, ultimately what happens is it goes through an exception process and the like. So by going all the way back to the comprehensive plan and really reinforcing the idea of, of integrating the land use and the transportation system, uh, it, can, it can really help us and relieve some of the issues that we have today along our, our uh, primary corridors. Because, you know, in many ways it's protecting the assets that we currently have. And that's something that regardless if you're an A, B, C, or D, you know, working, trying to perhaps and emphasize that or reinforce it in comprehensive plans because, you know, in the long run, it keeps us from creating, you know, the cul-de-sacs and just expanding all of the development. And, and linear commercial development is the most, again, most challenging for us because of the, it's, it's clobbering the, the arterial system. Yeah, Matt, yes, I, Mr. because I agree with uh, Ms. Valentine, and I think that I've used cul-de-sac too much because there's nothing inherently necessary. You know, it's nothing like we're not going to have all cul-de-sacs, okay? But what what the point is is there has to be more than one access point for a hundred house development. You know, where it's cul-de-sac, 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 dump it onto you know 50, uh, around 50. So what, what what I think these we have instead of giving them one access, maybe we give them three. <laughs> you know, so they're so it divides it up, or maybe we we 
we give them some on the back and some on the front, so there's 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 a, an outlet, you know. And I assume that's what we're talking about when we look at those kinds of things. Yeah, parallel road networks or interconnectivity between uh, compatible development types. And, and frankly, the other part is putting compatible development types next to each other, not putting commercial next to residential that then sort of forces, well, we can't make this physical connection because now commercial traffic will drive through the residential neighborhood. Right. It's it's that, that interaction and, and the parallel street concept and, and multiple access points and alternative access points can, can provide um, a two-lane highway with very few access points can carry considerable volumes of traffic. Uh, but when you start adding these entrances onto it, um, it gets it gets worn down pretty quickly. So uh, again, land use patterns. I think that this is a this is an area where land use is controlled by local government, but we're responsible for the highway system. And there's this there's there's, there's a difficulty there. And again, it's my entire career. It's been a difficult um, balance. If you look at when we flew over yesterday, the problem is there's not a lot of room for parallel road networks up here. I mean, you, you can look there, they're all, you'd have to cut through housing development after housing development to put the parallel road system in place. That's one of the challenges that's faced up here. And the point that if that's continued, that'll continue to be because you only have a very few major routes. And then we go to widen them, it causes lots of problems because they're taking homes and different things. So. It's a difficult situation, difficult problem. Uh, but it, it was very evident yesterday flying over, putting in parallel roads. There's not a lot of opportunity for it up here, and without destroying many, many homes. Mr. Whitworth. Uh, I certainly agree that the critical issue right here in this uh, metropolitan area is is, is uh, congestion, and we need to address it. And but I do think that this is the first opportunity that we've had to address an issue that has led to the present crisis, and that is inappropriate land use. So I would, I would certainly be uh, comfortable and encourage some incremental value on land use uh, because uh, this is the thing that created the problem that we're having now to fix. So, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, if you take a look at the scores here, uh, this is based on the current, the way it was done in the pilot scoring. Again, staff, we, we want to recommend changes to you on this. So the top scoring project here was a project to um, add a general purpose in HOV lane um, to an interstate facility at the edge of a metropolitan area. Um, it mostly scored the highest because it had an access management plan and a high number of SOV users. Um, it did not actually get points to a lot of the kind of land development aspects there. So that's, again, my staff are kind of going to be recommending to the board that we remove that access management component and then consider what what are the, what should we be scaling by? Because I, I do think that even in these activity center types of areas that are more transportation efficient uh, land use, there's going to be driving. And so we shouldn't be not considering that. So maybe we need to be looking at the residential units and kind of commercial square footage, but staff would like to take the next few days and provide some recommendations to the board on that. But we did want to show you how we scored it, because that's what we've been talking about up until this point. But we did see some deficiencies in the scoring through the pilot testing. Um, and with the board's kind of interest in this, we'd just like to have another uh, few days to give you some additional recommendations. Mr. Johnny, we have about 20 minutes for public comment, so I'd like to get to the scoring if you could, because uh, uh, we probably need to wrap this up before that and come back in, instead of having you come back up again. So, Yes, sir. So I just I jumped through a few slides here, so we're at the scores. These are the raw scores. So here are the top 10 types of scores, and as, as Mr. Whitworth talked about, you see a fair amount of A's and B's in the top raw score. It's before we divide by cost, and you see a mix of um, different types of roadway improvements, some of the transit uh, improvements and things of that nature. We can move to the bottom 10, um, and as Mr. Whitworth did note earlier, you see th there's a lot more C's and D's there. Um, also, as Mr. Matney said, there that, that does represent a much larger part of the land area of the Commonwealth, so there were, there were more C and D projects in this 38 that got evaluated moving forward. And again, this is just the raw score here. 
Now what I want to do uh, is really kind of, here's where we're getting into the relative scores. And this is where we're dividing that raw score by cost, and this is total cost. And I really want to draw the board's attention to the highest scoring project. And that is a very small project in a rural area whose raw score we gave it a rank of 29 out of 38. But once you divide by its cost, which was only $900,000, that far and away was the best bang for the buck out of these 38 projects. And so as we kind of talked about earlier, the raw scores, you know, the aggregate benefits, but what the law tells us to examine are what are the benefits per dollar spent. And so if you start to look through this, you kind of see a broader mix of area types. So all the weighting frameworks are represented and it would staff's kind of opinion that there's not more or less of one type versus another. So the number one project is an area type D and it's a reconstruction, you know, of an intersection. The next project is uh, some expansion buses that again rely on the metro system, which really bumps up their score there, and that's in a category type A. The next one is the commuter lot, also in a category type A. Um, then we move to uh, kind of an improvement to a local road to help uh, improve the flow at an interchange, and that's in a category type D there. And then you know we move to B, uh, C's, and there's a few B's moving down there. Um, for anyone who's in a category type B, I do want to say we had the least number of projects in B, so you're just going to see less B's in that. The B only applies in three areas, and so there just weren't a ton of projects in this 38 within the weighting framework of B. Mr. Chair, Ms. Rose, Mr. Don, you're just noticing that, to go to that, um, uh, did notice that on the, the final results that the B's, I mean, there are fewer projects, but the B's also seem to be much lower in terms of their scoring um, relative to many of the others. Uh, you know, these are the bottom 10, they're at the bottom. Are we finding there's something within that category that's going to need to be adjusted um, to make those those the, the uh, entities that are falling in those categories more competitive because this doesn't seem to show that B is as competitive with the others. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Rosen, at this time staff don't feel that it's shown that way, but what we can do is to continue to examine projects that might fall in category type B just to see if we keep getting um, that type of outcome in there, just looking at these 38. I think there were only three or four B projects, and again, it's just because they're there's only three areas yeah, three area. where the B area is applying, and you should not read anything. This is a small sample, which is scoring. You should not read it into the fact that it's in one area or the other. It's it really this helps to take a look at if you raw score versus cost. I mean, I think this clearly shows a the big changes are not between classifications. The big changes come between raw score and cost. Sure. I mean, I mean, that, and I think. Let me just read one point. I want to read this letter that we got. And this is a critical point here. The last sentence in the last paragraph is to what the considered is. Um, the Commonwealth is ultimately responsible for statewide transportation network, and while local projects should be measured against the CTB recommended plan, the six-year improvement plan ultimately must be for projects of greatest statewide significance not a collection of local projects. This clearly is saying that the project that scored the highest probably should not be considered the statewide level. Now, chances are it would be at the district level, but I want to point out to you uh, that it, I just want to point out, and I'm not suggesting it's right or wrong, but that's where we're being encouraged. So I, I, uh, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, guys. I, I am saying we need that's a... Uh, there are, are differences of opinions, of, of opinions and um, this is a clearly a, a, a very uh, different view in terms, I should say different view, that we've espoused here. So I just want to make sure that their view is heard, but also what the ramifications are it, it, with that. Yeah, Mr. Grosin. Yes, I, I have a question for Nick, but commenting on that, it probably would be a appropriate to have a further dialogue to, to, to find out if that's truly going to be a litmus test. Right. I think that... Uh, because if we don't do that, we're just going to be back before the GA next year, you know, with revisions to this, uh, to, to what we're trying to do. Nick, uh, explain to me the difference of HB2 cost again and total cost with some of the... Uh, 
different numbers you see where the total cost is lower than the HP2 cost in some of these rankings? Um, Mr. Garzinski, the, the total cost is just that. It's the all-in cost of the project, regardless of whether it's the specialized programs that the state and federal, that are federal funds that are exempt, local money, you know, money from a, a regional entity or any of that nature. That is that as well as the state funds that be subject to House Bill 2. That's the total cost. When we get to the HB2 cost, we exclude things like the Highway Safety Improvement Program, the CMAC program, um, the regional surface transportation funds controlled by the MPOs over 200,000, local revenues, and things of that nature. So that, that's the difference between those two columns. Um, and then just kind of also just want to remind people, again, when we move forward and we have these scorings, we're going to have them in those two categories. The high priority projects program by law is supposed to be focused on core statewide significance and the metropolitan networks. And that district grant program is really for any type of need identified in the VTRANS process from safety to local growth areas to regional networks and core statewide significance. So I do think a lot of these things we're hearing now with that change in law, which becomes effective this July 1, you'll start to see these things kind of work their way through. Mr. Chairman, okay. Mr. Brown. I'd like to make a, uh, an observation, make sure I understand this is correct. But um, I understand there's going to be a, a little bit of a change in, the, in um, the statewide competition for dollars is going to be based on um, its quarter statewide significance, and like Mike just said. But the six-year plan that VDOT puts out is interstate, primary, secondary, all across Virginia. It's not, we're, we're not limited, nor in my opinion, should we be limited to just using quarters, spending money on quarters statewide significance because it's a state transportation plan. And, uh, you know, now the General Assembly has the prerogative to change that, but, but that's not what our role is right now. And, um, and I think to change that and to give localities, for example, the ability to, to, to do that would lead to further balkanization. I mean, we already are looking at a little bit of balkanization based on the regional transportation model. If we start doing, changing how the six-year plan is put together, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not in the legislature so they can do what they want to do and the governor gets to sign it or not. But Right. But, uh, you know, I, I, I'd be concerned about that. I, 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 I kind of heard that coming in from that letter. Right? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I put it out there. I think Ms. Brzezinski's uh, suggestion is right. I will set up meetings to discuss and, and present what we think. But I, I did want to make sure that their letter was put out and point out some of the ramifications. And I'm not saying they're good or bad. It's just will cha it will change the result. And that's, uh, I think, something that... Uh, uh, in deference to them, I uh, wanted to make sure that it was heard uh, and that we have a discussion on it. So, uh, Mr. Weber. Uh, Nick, explain to me this little project where we're really talking about a $30,000 HB2 cost. In the future, would that be part of this conversation here? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Worth, I'm not sure we'd end up seeing an example that had such a so so low of a cost and that little of HP2 eligible money. What I think happened in this particular example is a project was underway, experienced a cost overrun, and the state applied some money that would hear you. I believe what happened in this project um, is that it was already underway, experienced cost overruns of, of around thirty thousand dollars, and what happened is the state added what would now be HP2 money to what was you know probably a safety project to cover that cost increase and keep the project moving forward. And so I don't think you're going to see a project that costs less than a million dollars and then has thirty thousand dollars of HP2 money. I wouldn't think so. And, and if these numbers are really ninety million versus thirty million, I doubt seriously if they've been at the top of the chart. Is that correct? I'm sorry, can you say that again, sir? If the total cost had been $90 million rather than 900000 It would have been the very bottom. It would not anywhere be close to the top of the chart because it is at the bottom of the chart uh, on the raw score. That is so correct. I really don't think this is a good example of how you can move from the bottom to the top. Well, I'm not sure I totally agree because cost, you know, is what clearly is driving House Bill 2. Now, I'm not saying that project, in other words, that we are, we're directed to get the biggest bang for the buck with our judgment. And uh, I think part of House Bill 2 is, 
looking at how we can reduce the cost of projects. And if you can reduce the cost of the project, it's going to score better. So I don't, I think that, uh, uh, and I, I think that's the real value of it. I mean, we, I'll just bring out the interchange at, at 630. We've reduced it $50 million. And yet, now we have a plan that has the utility that the other one's going to do for $50 million left. I really believe that was the intent of this legislation besides us uh, is to how do we get more efficient with our limited dollars? So uh, it may not, may or may not be a good example, but but cost is a big determinant in how these projects are going to score. Now we're going to give you the gross cost and the net, and I can see how that uh, you know can can skew maybe the thinking depending on how you put it in, or, or you have a different opinion. But if we, you know, maybe the benefits aren't really. Great, but if it doesn't cost a lot, now you may need to make the decision. There's a screening process that Nick hadn't talked about. You get screened to make sure the project even should be something we score, right? I mean, there's a screening. It's got to meet a certain. But if it does, I mean, I, you know, I mean, cost is going to be a big driver of, of this. Now, we have to keep in mind, you know, our whole objective is to make sure we have a coordinated network and nobody's getting away from that as part of the screening, but to think that uh, the whole idea is to incentivize the least fitting the purpose and need with the with a cost justified solution. And it's to, and it really is encouraging VDOT to come up with designs that meet that that may not be the most expensive. So it, it is. I mean, I, I think yeah, that's I, inherent. I, 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 I hear you. I'm just talking about this specific project. Well, I'm not sure. It, there are going to yeah. be very few projects, I think, that we're going to be looking at that are going to go from the worst score to the top score unless we're going to be talking about $30,000 projects. Don't know. Don't, I could be, could be, but I don't know not, because uh, it's all relative. relative and. Uh, and I do believe there are some. Look, we uh, put in what is those uh, the flashing lights uh, out at uh, Chevron. Chevron, and you know we were going to we were going to straighten the S curves up, and we've reduced the accidents uh, almost uh, in half significantly. significantly by just signing it different. And I think that's part of it because a big part of House Bill Two is also technology and driving. So, well, now, Mr. Chairman, that's on 81. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not it could be. It could be. Might be. You might have gone to meddling there. No, no, no. no. But no, I know you're right. No, you're right. That, that, that was yeah, we're encouraged to how we can use traffic management technology. That's a big part of House Bill 2. But we got I know we got to. And, and so, Mr. Chairman, I could just to kind of, so I, I think Mr. Whitworth has a, uh, you know, point. we're probably not going to see many projects like this one with a 30,000 HP2 cost. But if you also look at Project 3, the last one on this slide, that actually was in the bottom 10 and now is in the top 10 when you divide by cost. And so it was, you know, 33 on raw score, but it's 10 once you uh, take that cost into account. So I think the broader point is cost plays a large role in what the overall score is going to be. Um, there and just to kind of can jump forward to some of the HP2 costs so you can take a look at what that does as well as we look at this. And on this chart, we have the raw score, the relative score by total cost, and the relative score by HP2 cost. And you can see there are some changes. Um, the top four stay the same, though two and three reshuffle. Um, the first one that changes that is um, then that project I was just referencing, which is 33 and its raw score. When you divide by total cost, it's 10th. Um, but because there was some local funding on this project that paid for about half of its cost, it jumps actually from 10 to number 5 onto that. And again, moving forward, staff don't think that either the relative cost by total score or the relative cost by HP2 score, we don't think you can see either one of those in a vacuum. We think you're going to need to see both of those scores so you can understand its benefit towards its total cost as well as resources we might otherwise be leveraging to help us deliver those projects and bring more local and other non-state resources into some projects we're advancing. Okay, Mr. Rondo, we have more questions, but in five minutes we have to start. So what I'm going to do, I was hoping we'd finish it, but I don't think we should drop this. I think we should let Mr. We let Mr. Donahue come back after public comment to, to more questions on this. So I'm going to suspend this uh, right now. Um, 
Um, so we can take a few minute break because I don't want to be in deference to the there's many speakers. I'll, we told them 10 o'clock. So we'll take a uh, uh, five minute break. We'll suspend the workshop session now. We're only going to go into formal session to hear public comment. And then I'm going to suspend that and come back here because there's at least one presentation we have to hear before we can vote. So we're going to, uh, Mr. Arnie, if you'll come back and just go back on the slides, we'll, we're going to take a five-minute break. At 10 o'clock, we'll go into former session uh, and go into public comment, and then we'll continue after that. So we're in suspension right now. I think that. Okay. Okay. Well, we're
session. As I said before, we're going to come into this and we're going to go into speaker comments and then go back to our, our workshop. I did want to review the, the rules for speaking, uh, speakers here, the Commonwealth Transportation rule, Board rules. Uh, typically when we have our hearings around the state, uh, try not to limit your time, but we have a lot of speakers today. Our uh, role here is to do the business. We allow you to come talk, but I will hold you strictly to three minutes. Please don't take that as a sign that I'm being disrespectful, but in uh, honor to everyone and to the board here, the work we have to do, it will be held to three minutes. What I'll do is have you come up in the order in which you've been uh, uh, signed up, so there's no particular order. I'll let the next person know that they're on, on deck. Uh, we do actually do any comment you'd like to make is fine. We, we do uh, actually be civil and, and uh, uh, meaningful uh, comments as we take them seriously in that regard. Uh, but we will be held for three minutes, and I also want to apologize in advance if I say your name wrong. It's not intended to be disrespectful. I may not have read it in, uh, in the proper manner. So with that, we look forward to hearing from you. Our first uh, speaker today, I'll have you come up to the podium here, is Deanna Hare, if I've said that right. And then Daniel Zim will be next up. Um, so uh, as soon as I call your name, um, you'll be limited to the three minutes. So if you have handouts, I will just put them on the desk right there, and we'll make sure you get them. So with that, uh, Ms. Hare, and we'll start to three minutes, please. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much. Um, as you stated, my name is Deanna Heyer, and I'm here representing several neighbors and families who have concern about VDOT's recommendations for the 495-66 interchange specifically in the Outside the Beltway project. And we appreciate that VDOT and Secretary Lane's willingness to discuss alternative solutions, and we'd like to propose an alternative for you all, which would significantly reduce the financial cost and the footprint of this project. Specifically, we ask that you consider ending the I-66 toll lanes between Chambridge Road and Nutley instead of extending them to 495. We also propose that you offer five general purpose lanes instead between 495 and the toll lanes, and my reasons are stated within, and there are attachments in your supplemental materials also. VDOT's Tier 2 report notes that a similar option was actually considered by the, by the group, but it has been set aside for now pending further traffic analysis related to the I-66 inside the Beltway project. It's not being presented in the public hearings, and we're concerned that this viable option has been passed over due to the rapid speed at which the project is moving, which is understandable, but we don't want to leave any options off the table. In the design comparison that you're looking at, you will see that VDOT calls this option the do nothing at 495 alternative, and I'm here to say that we really prefer calling this the do no harm alternative, and we want to think about both the costs and the benefits of what we're doing. VDOT states these benefits as no right-of-way takings at all, no construction inconvenience and minimal construction costs. And to be clear, this would mean zero home takings and would negate the need to take land at Stanwood Elementary School and would eliminate the need for several bridge expansions. So you can see the dollar signs adding up in what we could save. Our proposal would also um, offer five general purpose lanes at a chuck po choke point at Nutley. Right now, you see on the news last night, there's four lanes if you include the red X lane, which is only offered at rush hour. And the VDOT current recommendation has seven lanes pinching down into three free lanes. 
So we don't know yet how many people are going to take those toll lanes to help alleviate this choke point, but we're proposing that we keep five general purpose lanes during this choke point in order to not make this worse. The Do No Harm alternative also offers significant environmental benefits by minimizing the impacts to the watershed because there would be less cement and less impervious surfaces. It also decreases noise and pollution by eliminating up to nine new flyover ramps that are proposed in these designs, and they're planned to tower 80 feet over our communities. There's simply no sound wall that you can create that will protect our families from these flyovers. So we ask that VDOT give time to complete the VDOT um, inside the Beltway traffic analysis and evaluate what the other improvements in the plan will do comments, for your comments, Ms. Hayes. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Sim, Daniel Sim. Okay, next we have Tris Van Story. Ms. Van Story? Oh, good. And on deck will be Jennifer uh, Siciliano. I said that correct. Yeah, I would suggest if you'd like, if you just leave them up there, we will review them because we are limited to three minutes. If you'd start the clock, please. Right. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Trish Van Story, and I'm the president of the PTA at Stenwood Elementary. I want to thank you for having me here, and I want to thank all of you for your service to our state. PTA officers are not traditionally involved in political issues, but this is no political issue for our school. The plan for I-66 expansion, as it is written now, simply spells the death of our ball fields at Stenwood Elementary. No more baseball, no more track, fewer gym classes outside, fewer school assemblies outside. Major and incalculable loss of facility by losing this land. I attended the community meeting at Kilmer Middle School where VDOT representative Susan Shaw fielded, the quest, fielded question after question about the VDOT plan to widen I-66. When I spoke, I asked the audience to raise their hands if their children attend Stenwood, used to attend Stenwood, or played ball on the fields at Stenwood. Probably 80% of the audience of 200 plus people raised their hands. Mrs. Shaw's response, quote, I have heard the Stenwood Elementary School impact loud and clear. We do have our designer here today. He's listening to all these comments, so Mike, I need you guys to come and look at an alternative that would remove the impact from the ball fields at Stenwood. Let's see what we can do about that, unquote. At that point, the entire audience clapped. I believe that was the first and only time Ms. Shaw received an ovation during the, that morning when she announced the good news that they would re-examine the treatment of Stenwood's ball fields. But now the new VDOT plan is out and it continues to butcher Stenwood's, Stenwood's ball fields in half. No change. Public speaking courses teach us to be persuasive, not angry, but I'm angry. No change? All to expand I-66 outside of the Beltway, where just a mile away, the expansion is all happening within the current walls. This is land that cannot be replaced, cannot be found somewhere else. So I beg you, save our school fields. Save our community fields. Find a better way to achieve your goal of easier commutes. There are so many alternatives and so many very smart people who work with VDOT. Make it a priority to find a better way. Keep I-66 within its current walls. And here are some pictures to show you how we use our ball fields and the students who will be affected by their loss. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Van Story. Thank we you appreciate, all. appreciate your time this morning. Uh, Jennifer Siciliano. Uh, and then next, Vinny Van Kastelson. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Siciliano. My husband, Mark, and I live at 8051 Pritchard's Court in Dunloring, and we would be adversely affected by the alternatives proposed. 
Well, I think the most effective way to provide input to proposed projects is not criticism, rather suggestions of ways the proposals can be improved to meet all needs. <clears throat> I do have to begin by saying that we were quite upset to learn about these proposals on a public website where our names were listed without our knowledge, so as opposed to an outreach effort that matched the significance of potentially losing our home. It has been said that postcards were mailed to those affected, and while I have yet to receive that postcard, I believe it was an insufficient method to approach such a decision with life-changing implications for those affected. I certainly acknowledge the need for change, but I don't endorse change that is not strategically thought through, uprooting established communities whose residents have spent years creating lives in a place they chose to live for all the reasons the regional marketing professionals and government representatives emphasize when attempting to sell the Fairfax County brand. I live, work, and play in the same general vicinity, and my kids live within walking distance of their schools. Isn't that one of the goals we've been trying to achieve? Now I'm being pe penalized for drinking that Kool-Aid. I, the original proposal showed a significant portion of our property being taken for stormwater management ponds, which are not part of the new designs. However, the new designs still show a large, as in 70 to 80 feet at its tallest, flyover ramp that will still eliminate the majority of our acre and a half of woods and current buffer. Additionally, these are slated to be general purpose lanes, meaning the sound of tractor trailers and jake brakes will become as common as the birds chirping, all at a monster height taller than any sound wall could ever mitigate. As a result, our property will significantly decline in value and investment we consciously made in Dunloring and in Fairfax County almost 20 years ago. The flyover ramp needs to go. Back to strategy. A few years ago when the hot lanes were being proposed, we were also faced with the, with the possibility of a right-of-way impact. However, those decisions with impact input from the community were significantly mitigated. There were many sleepless nights of unbearable pounding while the sound wall was being built for those eight to ten months, but we endured, and as a result, the result was mutually agreeable. I'd like to know how much that wall costs the taxpayers and why, after only a few years, it will be torn down to accommodate this new plan. That's not strategic at all. That's simply poor planning. And as a taxpayer in the Commonwealth, I'm pretty angry about that. I appreciate the opportunity to provide comments today, but I certainly hope that this board considers fully the implications of these proposals. There are alternatives to just building more roads, and you need to take a hard look at those before simply destroying communities and the lives of those who live in them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Benny Ben Castasan, I've said that correct, and then uh, Mary Tagapayan. <laughs> Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, it's Benny Venkatesen. I live in uh, uh, Dunloring, Merrifield area. I applaud you all. You've, you've moved the red line. You've, uh, redu you've increased the number of homes being taken. Um, you decided to go away from the P3, which is a good thing. We've seen it uh, negatively affect uh, 495 and 95. Um, we, have a, we have a regional problem at our hand that needs a regional solution. Susan Shaw has said that from VDOT. So that means the whole community needs to come together, all up and down 66. Right now, we're seeing just Dunloring, Maryfield, Vienna, um, and the Fairfax, as you get into where it's tight, it's been allowed to be developed, uh, be adversely affected. We see schools, land being taken, Stenwood Elementary, uh, Marshall Road on Nutley. Nutley's gonna take a huge impact. Um, I recently did my uh, kitchen this uh, December, and they asked me when I went in, would you like to do a rip and repair or rip and remodel? And I was, well, I just want to do rip and repair because that's the cheapest. And that seems to be what you all are doing with 66. You're not doing a true transform. Um, people aren't going to get in buses. I'm curious to see what study you have done in the area where people actually got in a bus um, that took them to access points other than straight to D.C. People don't go straight to D.C. They go to Reston. They go to McLean. They go to Tyson's Corner. Um, some go, they veer off down. So why would a person get in a bus just to dump them off at Nutley? perhaps. What we need is a regional solution. It, it's metro, it's VRE, it's buses, it's everything working together. We have mega buses in the area. Why not incorporate them? We see Loudoun County doing it, but not Prince William, not Fauquier County, for folks to get down there. 
Um, another thing to think about, we have 267 right here. It's a pure toll lane, and we have Route 7 right here. We see what happens in the morning. People either decide to pay the toll, or they decide to get in the traffic where they don't want to pay the toll. Now, I know 66 is a different animal. We can't just go and toll it. But I urge you to work with the, the Transportation Committee on the federal side and find that solution. If people want to live out in Haymarket and Manassas and have that cheaper home, we've decided in this area that we're going to have a less expensive home, we're going to have a modest home, and we're going to live in a transit-oriented neighborhood. And now you're taking those homes. You're punishing us. You're making us then go be part of the problem rather than the solution. We get on Metro. We don't we don't cause traffic. We, we, we ease traffic. So I urge you to go back to the Tier 1 study. I know uh, the Coalition for Smarter Growth has, has said that. I urge you to do that. I've attended several VDOT meetings, probably five or six. Not one of those meetings has anybody stood up besides VDOT representatives and said, this is a great idea. Let's move forward with this. In fact, one member in, in Vienna and Oakton came and he said, I'm from Fauquier County and this is not a good idea. What's it going to do? It's just going to increase traffic on 66. If you build it, they will come. People are going to continue to move out. Um, during construction and after construction, is just going to be as bad as it is now. Thank you. Thank you, sir, very much. Uh, Ms. Hagapai, and if I said that correctly, I apologize. And now back is Douglas Stewart. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. My name is Mary Hagopian, and I would like to speak to Fortune you this Matt. morning on behalf of my family with regard to the unwise and ill-thought expansion of I-66. We are a retired United States Marine Corps family, and we have lived in this area on and off for the last 30 years. In August of 2007, we purchased our home at 8056 Pritchard's Court in Dunloring, which abuts the I-495 interchange to I-66 on the northwest quadrant. Shortly after we moved in, we became aware of the expansion of I-495 and the development of hot lanes on it. With almost no time to react as homeowners with adjacent property, reconstruction of this interchange began in July 2008 and continued for the next four years. Throughout that time, we lived without a sound wall for nine months, were awakened many a night from demolition blasts of bridges, and became quite familiar with bulldozers and other heavy construction outside our front window. Interestingly, I would march my children out to the orange fence, which was one of the only things separating us from one of the largest interchanges on the eastern seaboard, and I would tell them, get a good look. You're seeing history in the making. You won't see this again for 50 years. Rarely do I admit this and don't tell my husband, but I was wrong. It took VDOT and Transurban four years to complete the I-495 hot lanes, and now, a mere three years later, not 50, they want to start all over again tearing down and reconfiguring what they just built at this interchange to add a high-speed high speed flyover ramp 80 feet into the air and take one of the only small forests remaining in the area away from the wildlife, away from the conservation easement of which it is designated, and away from a community that has been established here for 25 years. Compared to the vetting that was conducted and completed for the I-495 hot lanes and the decade it took to complete beginning in 1994, the rapid advancement of the I-66 widening, lack of home and property owner notification, and desired project start date less than two years from now could be considered, at the very least, reckless. I'd like to point out that for the eight years my family has lived here in this home, we've experienced VDOT mega projects for over half of them. And now you're asking us to endure another five years of disruption and destruction. What has my family done other than being good, law-abiding, Virginia voting, and tax-paying citizens serving this great country to deserve this egregious action that is being ramrodded into place by the Commonwealth of Virginia? We would like to see this project stopped altogether. However, we are asking you to scale back the design for this interchange and work within the existing right-of-way. We are asking you to utilize the current existing ramp that moves traffic from I-495 south onto I-66 west and not add any additional high-speed flyover ramps. We are asking you, VDOT, our elected officials, to be mindful of your citizens who live and work in this area and hear our voices. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Stewart, and then uh, Thomas Kramer. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning, Secretary Lane, members of the, of the Commonwealth Transportation Board. Uh, my name is Douglas Stewart. I'm speaking for the I-66 Corridor Coalition. We're an alliance of environmental, smart growth, transportation, uh, and bicycle groups uh, working for long-term effective solutions to transportation in the I-66 corridor. 
Uh, first, I want to say we very much appreciate uh, the commitment uh, that Secretary Lane has, has stated uh, for integrating transit, um, operating end capital into this project. Our concern, though, is that the plan will not adequately address near-term transportation needs and will also foreclose long-term solutions that address those needs. Our coalition favors a transit-first approach to, to solving our transportation problems, and we believe that the NEPA studies have failed to fully analyze a transit-first alternative that incorporates land use that would maximize trips by transit, walking, and bicycling. Uh, the discussion this morning about land use and transportation and coordination was, was very illuminating, uh, and it was really uh, great to hear about incre increasing methods to look at how our land uses are going to have synergies with our transportation projects. If you look at this corridor, this is a perfect example. We have evolving land uses, places like Dunloring, Fair Oaks, just outside the corridor where we're standing today in Tyson's, Route 28, of mixed-use, compact, walkable development. And one thing that we really think this project needs to be asking as we're moving forward is how is it encouraging these kinds of land uses, enabling more people to use alternatives to single occupancy vehicle trips? On the other hand, is it perpetuating patterns of land use, such as all of the development we've seen in the western part of the corridor where people don't have a viable transportation option besides single occupancy vehicle travel? Uh, we're going, I'm just going to speak to three specific concerns about the project. First of all, stormwater management. We, th we strongly urge that the stormwater management, current stormwater management standards for protecting the bay be applied to the entire roadbed, not just the added impervious surface. In our minds, that's not a nice to have, that's a must have. Uh, second, as, as I alluded to, we think that the current transit pride, uh, ridership projections, although it's a robust plan, we think they could be much higher if they were combined with, with more vigorous land use scenarios that enabled more people to connect to transit um, by other means besides driving. Uh, and third, um, we appreciate the incorporation of bicycling and pedestrian facilities. We'd, um, we understand those plans are still in development. Those plans really need to be integrated into the final design plans. Um, just one final comment. I'm actually speaking as uh, for the Virginia Sierra Club on this. We fully support keeping congestion mitigation at 35 percent for Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Thomas Kramer. Uh, and then Delegate uh, Jim Lemonian. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Thomas Cranmer. I am a transportation expert, according to the courts here. Uh, I'm with the uh, Fairfax County Taxpayers Alliance as first vice president. I'd like to comment that it's great that you're willing to consider prioritizing and decision making for uh, all of the roads. And it's, it's a step forward rather than just using political clout. However, uh, the analysis presented in the last uh, day and today uh, it has major deficiencies, is not used standardized methods of analysis. Um, to be specific, uh, for example, uh, in some of the presentations have been, to me, incomprehensible about why inside the Beltway, Route 66 is going to increase throughput of uh, cars. Uh, Arlington County has fought it for years. And then also outside the Beltway, uh, yesterday there was a presentation by uh, Fairfax County, and they didn't mention what any of the costs were. Well, this is absurd uh, you know, to have a big presentation about this. This was a problem with the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission, where they had a meeting just a few days ago, and not one word was used for U.S. dollars. I mean, this is incredible. Uh, you know, we've got clearly unlimited pockets. Uh, Mr. Lane certainly has uh, lots of money to dole out, apparently. So um, another problem has been with Route 7 
expansion from Reston Parkway to Tyson's, the Tyson's planners said Tyson's would fail if that was not expanded. It's not on the 2040 plan for NVTA. It's not in the uh, VDOT plans. They show a cost in the year 2020 for the projects uh, for the expansion, but it's not a budget item by any means. And uh, I had pointed out that uh, the Fairfax County uh, Department of Transportation had falsified the amount of money to be spent on that. They said it was $160 million. I said, that's absurd as a civil engineer. And I went to VDOT and worked with them, and they agreed that it was a $300 million project back in two, for 2012 dollars. It's probably going to be closer to a $400 million project. There's no analysis, cost benefit, anything about uh, expanding Route 7. There's a lot of resistance to doing it. The thank you much for your comments, sir. Uh, nope. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Delegate Lemonian. And then on deck is uh, Rob Whitfield. And Delegate, I'm uh, glad to see you here, sir. We have been keeping to a three minute limit if I, uh, with the citizens, and I'd respect that this morning, sir. And I normally go longer, but since we got so many, so I appreciate I'll, that, sir. I'll do my best. Thanks for including me today. And I'm yes, sorry sir. I haven't been able to spend the last uh, day and a half with you as much as I'm interested. Some of us have uh, day jobs in the General Assembly. I was thinking about what I might share with you today. And I got a few points I want to make, but I got a letter actually just coincidentally yesterday from a constituent who's a retired uh, Air Force general. He says, Jim, I've lived uh, all over the world, but I've spent most of my time, now 20 years, in Northern Virginia. I'm moving out, largely because of the traffic situation has become unbearable. You, the Virginia House of Delegates, VDOT, and the whole Virginia government richly deserve an F in your work on traffic. And then he signed his name. The last name happened to be Donahue. I assume there's no relation. Uh, but that's kind of where we are. We've got a lot going on. You might say, well, this person's just not informed. Well, actually, that was in response to a two-page letter I sent to 17,000 households in my district explaining everything that we've got going on. Uh, but the public perception's not changing. It's going to take time. We all know that. Uh, but we're up, uh, we're up against the pretty big... Uh, pretty big task. I want to give some credit where it's due, and I'm keeping an eye on the clock. Um, and some of you have heard this before, but in implementing House Bill 599, VDOT did an excellent job. I had a little bit to do with that bill. It's, it's, it's to rate projects rated according to their congestion relief in Northern Virginia, and they certainly exceeded my expectations as the author of that bill. But we only rated 37 projects, and only five of those were suggested by the Commonwealth Transportation Board. We've got at least another 37 to go, maybe even twice that, and I would encourage you to hurry up. One reason is we've got this public meeting on I-66 next week, and unless you're going to pleasantly surprise us, there's no 599 rating on I-66, inside or outside the Beltway. How can the public respond to these kinds of offers and opportunities without that information? Uh, you've heard a lot of people disappointed, but you don't have any data to counter their disappointment. Bi-County Parkway would be another one. Why hasn't that been rated? Okay, if that's a political issue, at least you have the tools and the data if you would use 599 uh, to address those concerns. One comment, I see I'm down to 40 seconds or so. Uh, I want to make, and, if I, and, and Mr. Secretary, I want to... Uh, go into more detail maybe at a later time on happy to meet with you. tolling and, and things on I-66 with you. But just to, just to say I am concerned that a toll would ever be used for something other than to pay for the construction, improvement, or the maintenance of a road. If it becomes a cash stream for some other thing, then a lot of people say it looks like a tax. Separate from the philosophical issue about whether a toll is a tax or not, it has the effect of taking things off budget. And you said yesterday in your slides, and I agree completely, fiduciary responsibility, transparent accountability, I'm all for you. But when you take that stuff off budget, then there's no need for people to come back and justify every time there's a budget process. I think I'm out of time. I'm going to have to ask you, sir. The reason I didn't sign that letter from other legislators saying that we ought to be weighted 60 percent is because I still think it ought to be 100. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for being here. Uh, uh, and we will be happy to meet with you, sir, to go through that. Uh, Rob Whitfield and then Jeff Anderson. Good morning, sir. 
Good morning, Mr. Secretary, members of the CTB. I'm Rob Whitfield. I've lived in Fairfax County since 1977, and in the last decade I've attended some 3,000 transportation and land use planning meetings on Tysons, on Reston, and among other things, the, the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority and the WMATA. And some of the major issues facing us have not so far been addressed in this meeting, and it doesn't look as if they're going to be. But let me start from the perspective of the I-66. I've given you there the sheet from the design guidelines from 2008 and would remind you that tra heavy rail transit only works where densities exceed 6,600 per square mile. That is not the case as the densities outside the Beltway, even in the Silver Line corridor. And so please do not consider the heavy rail option. Population employment densities do not support that. Um, and the costs, of course, are prohibitive. On HB2, there are far too many variables for any reasonable person to understand and evaluate in an objective manner. And so the question that troubles me most is who's going to be doing the rating and the ranking? And will that be consistent from one part of Virginia to another? Um, we have all these land use plans in Fairfax County, Tysons and Reston, where literally most densities are increased by five to ten times because of bringing rail. But the reality is that over 90% of our mobility relies on the highway network and, and fewer than 15% use the transit system. Even buses have to use the highway system. The spending provisions for transit vastly exceed the demand and they need to be reduced respective of demand. The uh, I-66 Oh, well, let me switch to MWA. MWA, what I gave you in here is, is from the 2006 proposal. You'll see by looking at the next page that they promised $300 million in capital improvements for the Dulles Toll Road. That has not been executed. It is up to the Commonwealth to enforce the agreement made in 2006. Uh, and, and finally, within the WMATA purview, the maintenance facility at Dulles Airport, which is a 260 million capital cost, let's say another 50 million design costs and land, the Transit Authority is providing nothing, even though half of the rail cars to be maintained there will be used elsewhere in the system, nothing to do with Dulles Rail. I've repeatedly asked Chairman York, who heads the DCAC and various other people, WMATA has to have its feet held to the fire. If they want the system to operate... Hey, Mr. Whitfield, and I, I, I understand your question. Yes, sir. Uh, Jeff yes. Anderson uh, and then Nancy Smith. Good morning, sir. Morning. Uh, I'm, my name is Jeff Anderson. I live in Vienna, Virginia. Uh, I'm a member of the Fairfax County Trails and Sidewalks Committee, uh, but I'm here speaking mostly as a member of Fairfax Advocates for Better Bicycling. Um, I'm also a parent of three children, and I literally just ran over here after riding my kids to school. So that's why I'm dressed in shorts and very casual. Um, I'd like to speak in, speak in support of the bicycle trail facility that we want parallel to I-66. Um, bicyclists in the area do not believe we are being heard enough. Um, the Virginia State Bike Plan that the CTB approved, we, we believe, is not being followed. We've had 500 county residents uh, send emails via a Washington area of uh, a Wabra alert to let them know that they want this facility added. Uh, we know that Fairfax County DOT is requesting a parallel bike trail. Uh, we do applaud the, the fact that the overpasses are including bike facilities, uh, and that's a result of having them included in the uh, hot lanes on 495. Um, but we need a parallel bike path in order to allow people access to the rapid bus and future metro facilities if those are ever built. Uh, at our recent Trails and Sidewalks meeting, one of our members was taking a class uh, in GIS mapping, and he decided to look at the population uh, centers around I-66, and using census data from the last census, he determined that 25% of the Fairfax County population lives within one mile of 66. 
Uh, and if we look at the other facilities that have been built in the area, the WNOD, the Custis Trail in Arlington, uh, and the Mount Vernon Trail, when those were built, we never imagined that those would be major commuter routes for the bicycle, uh, bicyclists in the area. Um, and Secretary Lane himself mentioned earlier that there's an inability to build parallel roads in our area, and yet we think we're ignoring the chance to build a parallel bicycle facility along 66. Um, the other night I was at a VDOT presentation, and they used the words multimodal, diverse choices, and connectivity. To not include the bicycle facility does a disservice to those words. Uh, the project date, uh, the data they're using is charting a 2040 end of uh, lifespan, which we'll have to revisit again. And based on the growth of bicycling as a viable transportation alternative, um, if we don't build the facility today, we don't believe it will ever be built. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Nancy Smith, and then Joe Balducci. Good morning, morning. Nancy Smith of the Northern Virginia Transportation Alliance. Um, well, yesterday and today's workshops have certainly covered a lot of uh, important and complex material. I'm sure you all have um, will have a headache by the end of the day. Um, but um, certainly information that requires a lot of further debate and examination on your parts in the months ahead. Um, but just a couple of observations and concerns from the Alliance um, over the last couple of days. Um, in terms of the complex House Bill 2 process, um, as currently drafted, uh, the House Bill 2 process um, seems to lack a, a critically important big picture statewide perspective, um, which is essential to achieving a well-connected Commonwealth. Um, and towards that end, what, currently in the draft, it proposes that project submissions would be done by local local MPOs and regional planning authorities, but we would suggest that this body should have a more significant role in project submission. Um, in terms of congestion mitigation measure, um, particularly for the Category A um, in Northern Virginia, um, the Alliance as well as the greater Northern Virginia business community have recommended a weight of at least 60 percent be assigned to congestion reduction, um, and that the 35 percent is totally inadequate. Mr. Secretary, you have said that facts, not ideology, um, should drive the process. However, weighting assignments will determine the outcomes of these projects. An assignment of only 35 percent for congestion reduction in the most congested regions of the state is more indicative of ideology rather than a factual approach to the needs. As to land use, um, Northern Virginia's land use practices and quality um, of development exceed those of most other comparable areas of the nation, and so does our transit usage. Our congestion is not the result of poor land use or lack of transit, but of a quarter of a century of failure of the state to provide adequate funding for infrastructure for an economy that was generating tens of thousands of new jobs and 40 percent of the Commonwealth's revenue. Again, assigning only 35 percent of congestion mitigation will most surely ensure that congestion continues to grow and our regional economy continue to slow. Moving quickly to I-66 outside the Beltway, um, the Alliance commends the Commonwealth for taking an initiative to determine the potential costs and benefits of its own design build approach, and hopefully this will incentivize everyone to sharpen their pencils, um, but that can really only be achieved with the release of the financials that we referred to yesterday, so we look forward to seeing that. Um, the details and assumptions in the study will require careful examination, but we can all agree that the ultimate objective must be the best deal for the taxpayer. But care must be taken to strike a careful balance and find a financing model that does not impede the Commonwealth's ability to address our other more immediate needs in Northern Virginia and elsewhere while moving, um, continuing to move forward on the developments on I-66. So I'm almost out of time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. And then um, we have uh, John Eltroth, if I've said that correctly. Uh, Good morning, Mr. Morning. Chairman and members of the Commonwealth Transportation Board. My name is Joe Vidalich, and I'm the Vice President of the Fairfax County Chamber of Commerce. Before I go any further, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Nancy Smith uh, from the Alliance, and we stand with the Alliance on our comments on HB2. On the issue of Interstate 66, we welcome the call from Secretary Lane for an open and vigorous public debate and discourse on the scope and financing of I-66. The Chamber's unfettered belief, and for that matter, the belief of 15 other business associations, is that the private sector can deliver and has delivered time and time again innovative and entrepreneurial solutions that achieve the congestion relief that Northern Virginia businesses, its residents, are demanding and expecting. Like the Secretary, we too believe that a multimodal approach on I-66 is the best approach. Like the Secretary, we believe that the Commonwealth Transportation Board must act as good fiduciaries in that regard. And like the Secretary, we too want I-66 done right. 
The chamber wants the private sector to compete and compete fairly. The Interstate 66 project presents a unique opportunity to attract private investment to the Commonwealth. <coughs> Properly structured, a P3 will enable the Commonwealth to leverage the limited state and federal transportation dollars in the I-66 corridor and leave some for other important projects. The private sector can mitigate a substantial amount of risk to Virginia and minimize the impact to community and frankly save many of the homes that might otherwise not be in a VDOT model. We agree with Mr. Frail and Mr. Garzinski and Mr. Dyke that the process needs to be open and transparent. Therefore, we are asking the Secretary to disclose and produce for the vigorous debate and discourse he referenced yesterday the full analysis and data behind the presentation, including the initial OP3 analysis. In fairness, the private sector cannot compete against some of the generalities that we heard yesterday, nor is it fair to leave it up just for three PowerPoint slides. Data is important. We owe it to Virginia to explore all that in detail. With that analysis in front of us, we can then ask the tough questions. Will the state really be required to increase its debt capacity? How will the state mitigate traffic and revenue risk, a risk barely noted yesterday, but identified by rating agencies and other organizations as the riskiest element of the project? What source of funding will be used to pay the state's bondholders if traffic doesn't meet projections, as is often the case? VDOT has never historically assumed traffic and revenue risk of this scale and complexity before. What commitment will be required from NVTA and, other regional, uh, and, and at the expense of other regional projects? Who will be responsible for cost overruns and delays, like we've seen on the projects like Springfield Interchange and Dulles Metrorail? And where will that money come from? Finally, and most importantly, the media release assumes a maximum upside for the state with no downside at all, an unrealistic scenario and consistent with the reality of these tow projects. And quite frankly, we don't do that in business. We believe in the process and achieving what is best to unlock the new Northern Virginia and the new Virginia economy through meaningful transportation solutions. We look forward to opening the books and examining the data behind yesterday's information so that we can compete and we can find that, public, that private partner for the public if one works out for the Commonwealth. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you very much. Mr. Elthroth and then Sheila Blaine. Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning, and thank you. I'm John Ellsroth. I live at 8100 Reviton Court in Dunloring. Uh, I have two comments this morning on I-66 and major transportation corridor. One is the P3. I'm pleased that the enthusiasm for a P3 option on I-66 has waned. It is difficult for me to see that the existing P3 deals have been or are a good deal for Virginia, especially the long-term 70 to 80 year deals. If, if you look back, back to 1935, 80 years ago, and consider the transportation conditions at that point and what changed in the meantime, you might say, what, what are we going to look like 80 years forward? Uh, when considering that the roads <clears throat> were built under the Defense Highway Act uh, are being sold to a foreign corporation, that to me is perhaps a questionable issue there. Uh, my second point is that this should be a rail, not a road option. Uh, Rob uh, Woodward's uh, comments notwithstanding, take a look out the window of this hotel. Look at the economic engine, the silver line is leading. Here at Tyson's and at Points West. Move to the orange line. Merrifield, Boston. Look at the red line over in Maryland. Look at the economic development that the rail option is driving. Uh, it is the future, rail is the future, and in fact, rail is now the future for communities that already have it. Um, so those are my two basic comments. I have one other uh, note, uh, just on uh, based on the comments. Um, better signal management. If you could get three re green lights in a row, wouldn't that help congestion mitigation quite a bit? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much for your comments, sir. Uh, Sheila Blaine and then Carol Hook. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Thank you. Um, as a self-employed citizen with three kids and a day-to-day -day life to manage, I'm busy. The news over the last few days about how I-66 might best be improved is at best confusing to me. At worst, it feels deliberately distracting. Secretary Lane, you had an op-ed one day in the Post, and you're quoted the next day on the Metro section front page. And at 10 p.m. last night, I read yet another new piece. 
And the messages to me are a little confusing. So when I first sat down to write these comments, I'll, I'll admit I was in defensive mode. Then I finally found time to delve into that 1,000 page tier two assessment. So I do want to thank VDOT. It appears that they really did do some research about alternative modes of transportation. Overwhelmingly, people support multimodal transportation like extended metro, rapid bus transit, and VRE expansion. So my question is this, why are these other modes put off mainly until after I-66 is already widened? VDOT has said that buses are part of the project, but will be fully implemented only once the road is widened. The same is true of metro expansion, if the project plan actually leaves room to do that. Why wouldn't you invest our money in buses before spending $3 billion on the road? VDOT could use the existing right lane to operate commuter buses all day, more during rush hour. Starting in Haymarket, some buses go nonstop all the way to the city, others stop at Tyson's, Falls Church, Arlington. The VDOT's Tier 2 assessment looked into 47 improvement concept scenarios involving a mix of general purpose lanes, managed lanes, metro extension, light rail, bus rapid transit, and VRE extension. All of the top 10 solutions involved extending metro. The Tier 1 study was supposed to investigate Orange Line extension in 2014. In January, we were told it's off the table, and it's not in any of the long-term plans, according to WMATA. The first phase of the Silver Line cost under $3 billion. That's about or less than the cost of the 66 proposed. Roslyn's tunnel limited capacity is a concern, I understand. But not all eastbound commuters are heading all the way to the city. Some trains could turn around at Tyson's or Falls Church. That's already happening on the Red Line in Silver Spring. I'd like to look back at Ashburn and Leesburg and the toll road. I remember when ads encouraged people to move out there because the toll road was underutilized. Well, guess what? People did move out there. And the road got congested. And you know what the solution was? The Silver Line. If VDOT isn't widening 66 inside the Beltway, I'd like to see a better effort to preserve communities and retain the toll in, outside the Beltway as well. We live in one of the most affluent areas in the country, just outside the capital of our nation. Surely we have some of the brightest minds in urban planning. The younger generations want transit-oriented housing and walkable communities like Tyson's and Mosaic. Is more, lane, more lanes really the best we can come up with? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Carol Hook. And then Brian Zelli. Good morning. Good morning. I want to thank you all for allowing us to speak with you today. My name is Carol Hook, and my home is one of the homes that Virginia Department of Transportation has indicated it will be taken for the proposed Transform 66 outside the Beltway. To some extent, however, <clears throat> that's irrelevant. I'm not here today to appeal to your motions. I'm here to discuss the concept and my experience with induced demand. Induced demand is a phrase used to capture the simple and intuitive notion that expansion of capacity will be met with an attendant increase in demand. In other words, build it, they'll come. As a native Californian, it surprises me that VDOT refuses to acknowledge or seriously engage with concept of induced demand. You see, for the first 66 years of my life, until I moved here two years ago, I lived in Southern California and have seen the mistakes VDOT is making on a much larger scale. For instance, growing up in Southern California, I saw the 91 expand from a two-lane road into a 14-lane freeway. In this time, one thing remained constant. It was always congested. Every expansion promised relief from the congestion, but instead, more people moved further away from their place of employment for larger and cheaper housing, resulting in more commuters, which quickly outstripped and the, the additional capacity of the expanded roads. Even now, with two toll lanes in each direction, there is no relief from the congestion. No road I have ever seen can be built faster than homes can be built or people move. Unfortunately, they are now in a situation where they cannot add the transportation needed, such as the metro. We can even see this with the 495 hot lanes. It has brought some relief for those who can afford to use the hot lanes. But all of the regular lanes appear as congested, if not more. For every one driver that takes the toll or hot lanes, they will be replaced with another driver not using the hot lanes. Induced demand is not just a fringe theory. It is well-documented phenomenon across many cities in the United States, such as LA and Atlanta. In contrast, such, such some cities, sorry, as in Paris, have 
actively reduce the number of traffic lanes. At first, there's public outcry. The congestion would be get significantly worse, but it did not. Instead, what happened in Paris, the congestion forced people to use public transportation. I understand that pol policymakers are always asked to solve the problems. Some problems cannot be solved. This is one we need to find a better solution for than taking of homes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Brian Zelli, uh, and then Jeff Romella. Good morning, Mr. Secretary and the Board. Um, I really appreciated your thoughtful comments on the P3 process yesterday and the desire to take a broader view with the, the process in the context of I-66. So that was a very welcome news indeed. Uh, the current transfer, Transform 66 plans do not re uh, reflect the perspective that regional problems need regional solutions. Instead, the plans presented by the Commonwealth will severely impact and destroy the communities just outside the Beltway. And the supposed beneficiaries of the plan, the car drivers, <clears throat> will be forced to endure the permanent loss of a free lane that exists today, our, our beloved Green Arrow Lane, or pay tolls with unlimited increases for decades to come. Rather than provide a consistent approach to Interstate 66, the plans offer the, are, are choosing to transform the roadway outside the Beltway remarkably differently than the plans for inside the Beltway. With each new detail exposed about this transformation, we learned the project's true impacts, including significant land taking and homes lost. The displaced are your neighbors who live in transit-oriented housing who choose not to have long automobile commutes, many choosing not to drive at all. For them, the project won't just bring increased noise, polluted stormwater, and the loss of beloved yards and school recess fields. The current plans mean the loss of pedestrian transit access, buffer zones of green space forever gone, and new walls constructed just feet from bedrooms. The permanent life of brightly lit flyovers towering up to 80 feet over the neighborhoods. Under VDOT's plans, the very residents who invested in the transit-oriented housing are the folks who will see their neighborhoods destroyed, their children displaced from schools, and their homes taken away, with many elderly and minority residents among those watching their homes destroyed. This car's first approach will have a devastating effect on the people who did the very thing that the planners said was good, to live near our jobs and take public transportation. And for what purpose? To pave the way for more commutes, longer commutes, longer car trips, and even more sprawl into the diminishing open spaces of Northern Virginia. While the wealthy commuters might well be able to afford a pricey commute twice a day, the working class commuters will face the loss of that free peak lane forever. We know that Interstates 95 and 495 are at a standstill at rush hour today. Take a, a look at right over here at Tyson's, northbound or southbound on 95 at the end, of, uh, at, I'm sorry, during the, the evening rush. You'll see that with the express lanes open and running right now. The congestion has increased at those endpoints. This plan for, is for pavement now with promises of some buses later. Is that the best way forward for our region? We urge a focus on moving people rather than just cars throughout the corridor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Jeff Ramallah and then uh, Kwong Hai, or we, I'm um, here. Oh, thanks, yes. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Hello, my name is Jeff Ramallah. I'm married. I have three daughters, a two-year-old twins, and a 17-year-old. I've been in Dunloring since 1996 and own a small IT company in McLean, Virginia. I've seen a lot of change, and I understand the need for change. However, I'm asking that you transform 66 wisely. Dunloring was founded in 1886. It's a fragile community and is the earliest platted subdivision in Fairfax County, and possibly in Virginia. We need to celebrate and protect this history. <clears throat> Virginia and Fairfax County are fortunate to have some really smart, business-minded people serving the government, and we thank you all for your public service. However, in the case of the Plan 66 transformation, I believe our public servants and VDOT have failed us if we continue with the current proposed plans or alternatives. Tax-paying citizens of Virginia should be placed first in solution developed that is best in the best interest for us. As I understand it, based on the video on YouTube, uh, Secretary Lane, uh, Virginia legislation, passed, uh, legislation was passed last year that mandated the CTB to prioritize and fund projects according to five criteria. 
I'm not going to read through them. Sounds like they're in, in some uh, level of uh, change right now, but I'll, I'll go right to it since I only have three minutes and looks like one minute, 40 seconds left. Congestion mitigation. VDOT has admitted at several public meetings that I've attended that current designs will not solve the congestion problem. In fact, the current design solution will actually cause more congestions. If commuters use the hot lanes as intended, they will come in greater numbers to the choke point at 495 and 66. If the hot lanes are ended prior to Vienna at the metro and more commuters get on the metro or buses, the congestion at 495 and 66 choke points will be alleviated. In fact, the current proposal, which would eliminate the free green lanes that we've all heard about in favor of hot lanes, will make congestion worse instead of better. Hot lanes on 495 and 95 have conflicting data, uh, but current data shared to the press most recently by the Washington Post say it's not as successful as planned. So if less commuters use the hot lanes than use the free current green lanes, you're guaranteeing more congestion despite billions of dollars spent. Why would you want to continue investing in an approach that offers questionable success? Economic development, and I'm going to run out of time, but uh, in the economic development area, you can see that the development in the communities will be hampered as well as if other roads are not built because building them will cut into the prof profits provided by the hot lanes. So there's no economic development incentive there. Mobility. Mobility will be negatively affected, particularly in my community and those further out. There will be reticence on the part of either government or private entities running the toll lanes to develop other modes of transportation. Environmental. We can go through that. The return on investment. The return on investment for this project is much greater if the hot lanes are ended at the Vienna Metro. This project would cost significantly wrap up, less. Sir, please. Yes. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for coming this morning. Yes, uh, and then we have Julie Burka. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kwang He from Dan Loring. I'm here to explain why the Transform 66 project will be bad for residents, commuters, and Northern Virginians. VDOT has claimed that all the devastation to Dan Loring, Vienna, and Falls Church communities will benefit commuters by easing congestion. Yet, the more we learn about the project, the more we learn that the project will leave commuters worse off than they are today. Specifically, VDOT's proposal involves the elimination of one general purpose lane, the lane that many Virginians refer to as the Red X lane, shoulder lane to create two hot lanes. The Transform 66 project will actually result in a decrease in general purpose lane during rush hours. In other words, commuters are forced into horrible decisions, sit in even worse traffic, or pay a hefty toll twice a day, adding thousands of dollars a year to, cost, to the cost of their commutes. Moreover, VDOT has stated that it has no intent to expand I-66 inside the Beltway until at least 2040. Even if some commuters do not care about paying thousands of dollars a year to use the hot lanes, the project is just funneling even more drivers into the two, same two-lane bottleneck inside the I-66 inside the Beltway or the already congested 495. Why expand I-66 outside the Beltway and make Fairfax into a parking lot? VDOT has a, a different treatment for Arlington and Fairfax. Arlington has consistently pushed back against VDOT expanding I-66 to protect their precious uh, existing communities. VDOT continues to tell the public that they have reduced the po possible animal, animal domain to only 12 to 18 homes. However, they always omit the other hundreds of partial land takings and thousands of um, adjacent homeowners, they are negatively impacted along the 25 miles I-66 corridor. VDOT can eliminate almost all of the complete and partial home takings by ending the hot lanes between Chambridge Road and Nutley Street. Metro is costly, but it is not an expense. It is an investment that creates new economic developments areas like Tyson's Corner and Mosaic District. Business wants to be close to the metro so that workers can reach their office by metro, and people want to live near metro so they can easily commute to work. To begin with, extending the Orange Line Metro to Fair Oaks, where there are thousands of existing parking space, this <coughs> truly reduce the car from the road and fix I-66. Please correct this before it's too late. Please build within the existing right of way. Do not let VDOT take lanes or homes like they are free. 
like mine. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heath. Thank you very much. Uh, Julie Herka and then uh, Sean or Sui Lee. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Thank you, Secretary Lane, for investigating the financing of the I-66 project as reported in the Washington Post yesterday. I have been wondering, since you announced the plan to have VDOT toll I-66 inside the Beltway, why you would treat 66 outside the Beltway differently. Outside, we've been told it will likely be a P3 with a private company paying $1 billion of the $3 billion and then collecting all tolls as they do on 95 and 495 for the next 75 years. I see when in traffic on 495 and 95 that the investor-owned express lanes are not a solution to congestion but feed off it. I understand the private investor's expedience in securing more lanes on 95 and the desire to do so on 66 before taxpayers figure out how bad this is for the taxpayers and commuters of Northern Virginia. I sit in Fairfax County budget meetings listening to discussions on ways to increase revenue and then read full page express lane ads selling Northern Virginia's commuters their time. Why P3s are a bad idea when it comes to building toll roads. The business plan depends on low occupancy vehicles. Virginia has to compensate the private investor if too many HOV cars or buses equal too little toll revenue. Commuters pay twice, once for the toll and then again if not enough cars are paying tolls. And in the case of I-66, a third time, as the plan calls for rebuilding bridges and infrastructure that were just completed for the, nine, for the 495 toll lanes and at the Dunloring and Vienna metro stations. P3s are a bad idea because of the 75-year contracts, the no-compete clauses, and the 10K or high, higher tolls annually for commuters, uh, an option most commuters can't afford who live in Centerville or Haymarket. In yesterday's Post article, Mr. Gifford from GMU stated that the private sector has a fairly good track record on these types of projects. It is in their best interest to do so. For I-66, it's also in P3's best interest to do unnecessary construction like redoing the 495-66 interchange to connect to their current 495 investment. But this is not in the best interest of neighborhoods, the environment, commuters, and taxpayers of Virginia. Yes, what an ideal revenue risk project in Mr. Gifford's words and in Secretary Lane's investigation has discovered. Like I-66 inside the Beltway, let's keep the revenue in Northern Virginia. In Virginia, a foreign investor is being allowed to squeeze commuters for the next 75 years, the majority of whom work for the federal government. Please don't repeat P3 mistake on I-66. Thank you, ma'am, for the comments. Ms. Lee and then uh, Dan Holmes. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. I'm Sue Lee from Dunloring. I'm here to emphasize the devastating impact on Dunloring, Vienna, and Fortress residency communities as a result of the I-66 outside the Beltway project. The project will severely impact or destroy our transit-oriented communities. These are your neighbors, such as my family, who live in transit-oriented housing. We chose to live in the smaller home and pay higher taxes to avoid driving and traffic congestion. We are the people who get up in the morning and take the metro to work. We don't drive. However, under Vito's revised plan, hundreds of people, including myself, will still lose our homes and lands completely or partially. Our children's school will still be lost partially. The nature's buffers, the tree buffers between our homes and I-66 will be removed. The project will bring increased noise and air pollutions from years of construction and the new flyover rings. The new walls will be constructed just feet from your bedrooms and several huge 80 feet noisy flyover ramps will travel over neighborhoods. The above negative impacts will decrease home values and tax revenues in Dunloring, Vienna, and Fortress communities. The project will significantly undermine investments from the Fairfax County, from the Fairfax County and developers in creating walkable communities in Fairfax. The very residents who invested in transit-oriented housing are the people who will see our bad neighborhoods destroyed our homes condemned and our children moved to other schools. 
thousands will face permanent aftermath left behind. The attached maps that you see on your handout, um, it shows that there's no change has been made for the five homes and the Stanwood Elementary School in Dunloring, based on the revised plan from last week. The five homes remain to be taken completely on one of the, one of the five homeowners. All our homes are within five minutes of walking distance to the Dunloring Metro Station and Stanwood School. Given the unbeatable transit convenience, it is unrealistic for VDOT to tell us that they will find us a comparable home that will meet the same needs that we have today. Also attached, you'll see a picture from a child to Governor McCauley asking the government not to take his home. May I ask Secretary Lane, Commissioner Kilpatrick, Director Mitchell, and all the CTB board members here, have you ever lived with the fear and stress that Vito is going to take you home and make you move to another place that you may not like and that may not meet your needs. Would you let Vito take your homes, part of your children's school field and parks, and turn it into Hotland with no guarantee of great lot relief? It is not reasonable to use eminent domain against us, the very transit-oriented residents. Even one home taken is too many. Please build within the existing right of way and invest in mass transit options to get cars off the road. Thank you for listening to our voice. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, Dan Holmes uh, and then Sonia Brehe. Good afternoon. My name is Dan Holmes. I'm with the Piedmont Environmental Council and I appreciate this opportunity to address the board. I'm here to speak on the HB2 implementation and want to raise several concerns that we have as we move forward. One is uh, we believe that there needs to be an increase to the weight of environmental quality and land use factors. Uh, environmental quality is the lowest ranked factor in each of the four area types. Uh, Virginia's natural resources are central to our health and economy. Moreover, impacts to environmental and historic resources that are ignored or inadequately considered early can often translate into major delays uh, and increased costs for projects later in development, as was seen with uh, Route 460 and the Bi-County Parkway. The HB2 process should put greater weight on these items so that proposed projects with serious environmental problems can be identified before significant resources are invested. We urge you to increase the weight allocated to environmental quality to 20% in all four uh, area types. In addition, the importance uh, to the link between transportation and land use has been increasingly recognized, including the impact of development patterns and the cost and effectiveness of transportation projects. Um, the potential to also spur environmentally and fiscally costly sprawl. We can no longer afford to overlook these links. The draft policy guide places too much emphasis on congestion reduction and fails to adequately reflect how some of these projects can lead to diminished return on investment if not all issues are considered. Experience has demonstrated that some projects merely shift congestion uh, and increase sprawl and therefore overall congestion for the region. To be consistent with the approaches taken for other criteria, we suggest that an approach would focus on at least three types of impacts and add the points for each to the score for impacts of sensitive resources that would equal half of the environmental quality score. These three impacts would be wetlands and streams, park, recreation lands and wildlife refuges, and uh, historic resources. Perhaps one of the most important factors that has to be considered here is congestion relief and, uh, and economic development. Um, and we just want to make sure that as we proceed that, that things that will actually uh, be, are now being viewed as potentially solving our congestion issues may actually increase the problem. Specifically, um, when we're talking about building air in areas, new roads in areas that would open up new lands to development further away from where these job centers are, it is a recipe for disaster. We've seen it before, we're going to see it again. Um, with regard to economic development, the economic development factors should assess both positive and negative economic impacts to proposed project in order to provide an accurate assessment of the true net impact of the economic development project. If economic development factor only considers new businesses created, it will give a highly distorted and accurate assessment of the impact. For example, agriculture is the leading industry in the Commonwealth. When combined with forestry, we have a total economic impact of $70 billion, providing Thank you, Mr. more than 400,000 jobs. Okay. Thank you very Thank much, you. sir. Thank you. Uh, Sonia Brighi, uh, and then Dennis Drinker. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, taking the time to hear our comments. Uh, my name is Sonia Brighi. I live in Falls Church. I'm a mother of three, and 
a biking household. Uh, we commute to work. We try to commute the kids with the kids to school and often for running errands around town. Um, so I'm here because I wanted to express that to truly transform the I-66 corridor for the future, we need long-term smart solutions that are truly multimodal, not just for cars. But we need to maximize public transit, biking, and walking. We appreciate the incorporation of bicycle and pedestrian facilities at the I-66 crossings. That's going to be a huge help with maintaining that connectivity in the neighborhoods. However, the proposed Tier 2 environmental impact statement does not include the parallel bike trail um, and lacks details about the connectivity to transit stations along the corridor. A shared use trail along I-66 will provide local residents and commuters transportation options, enabling them to shift more trips to walking and biking. Um, a parallel trail along I-66 will provide direct access for biking and walking from those neighborhoods to schools like Stenwood Elementary School or Oakton High School, to suburban centers like the Merrifield, Fairfax Corners, and Fair Oaks, and access to metro rail stations at Dunloring and Vienna, and future stations as it gets extended out towards Centerville. Um, studies by the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority show that investments in biking and uh, pedestrian accessibility to transit stations can significantly increase transit ridership and at a cost that's much less than building costly parking structures. Um, an I-66 trail would also provide regional connectivity to the WOD and the Custis Trail inside the Beltway, providing um, residents in central Fairfax County connections to work, to bike to work throughout um, the county and beyond. And as we heard earlier, data shows that 25% of our county residents are within that trail benefit area. So I urge you to please invest in safe, walkable, bikeable communities by maximizing our investments in biking and walking, especially the parallel trail, as part of our solutions to this I-66 corridor. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dennis Drinkard and then uh, Michael Lambert. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Secretary Lane, board members. Uh, I'm here, uh, Dennis Drinkard, speaking on behalf of the Committee for Dulles. Committee for Dulles is a dynamic community of business and business leaders, policymakers, and dedicated individuals. We represent businesses that have in excess of 10,000 employees. Founded in 1966, the committee plays a pivotal role in making Dulles International Airport the premier air travel service provider for the national capital region and an economic feeder for the business community. We are the only business-focused organization in the United States that supports an international airport. The Committee for Dulles is dedicated to achieving the full potential of the airport and the economic growth of this region. The committee considers transportation one of its top priorities and improving our regional transportation network essential for continued prosperity. The Committee for Dulles commends the Virginia General Assembly and the Commonwealth Transportation Board for creating a process to objectively evaluate road and transit projects. We believe this evaluation process will ensure that straight state transportation resources are invested in an objective, performance-based manner to reduce congestion and promote economic development. However, the Committee for Dulles is concerned that the implementation of HB2 has become considerably more complex through the inclusion of safety, accessibility, environmental quality, and land use considerations. These have resulted in less emphasis being assigned to two measures of greatest importance to state legislators, citizens, and businesses, which are congestion reduction and economic development. The fact that Northern Virginia Transportation Authority has been char charged by the General Assembly with producing a regional transportation plan with the primary objective of reducing congestion to the greatest extent practical and to prioritize HB 2313 on projects that are expected to provide the greatest congestion relief relative to the cost of the project clearly indicates the legislator intend the passage of HB2 was to assign major weight to congestion reduction, especially for highly congested areas such as Northern Virginia. Therefore, we strongly recommend that a minimum of 50 points be awarded to congestion reduction for Northern Virginia Category A. And, and, and implement that as a minimum for that. I appreciate your consideration for that. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. you for the time. Yeah. There. That's very good. Thank you. Uh, Michael Lambert uh, and then Stu Whitaker. 
thank you for providing this comment period. My name is Morning, Sir Lambert. I'm here to voice my opposition to aspects of the I-66 expansion plan. My chief concern is the proposed annexation of homes and property along the corridor and the adjacent Gallows Roadway. My property is not one of these proposed homes, so my objection here is largely a moral one. I believe that a high standard should be used when we, we do these kind of things and that the use of this kind of power shouldn't be done in the interest of private public partnerships that are popular here in Virginia. My concern with the proposed widening is that it will ne ne negatively impact the value of the revitalization that is in my neighborhood, Dunmoring, and which we have enjoyed over the past decade. Fifteen years ago, my neighborhood turned over from gentrified housing development to one filled with young families, new residents, building new homes. Property values have been on the rise and they continue to go up. This is not an area filled with blighted urban homes. This makes the proposed seizure of land for the interstate all the more troubling. We have seen significant redevelopment in the Maryfield Town Center, to which we have access. The community is designed to be pedestrian friendly. Businesses in the Maryfield area depend upon high property values and net incomes of those who inhibit these neighborhoods. My neighborhood is an important residential quarter for the Tysons Commercial District, and a wider 66 would inhibit it pedestrian traffic, delay, and perhaps deprioritize multimodal transportation options in our neighborhood. A wider gallows would also serve to encourage vehicular traffic at the expense of pedestrian bus and bike access. A beltway is two miles north of Gallows Road. It's the proper book, the roadway for high traffic and not gallows. VDOT has also had minimal success in reducing noise pollution along interstate routes. Hopefully you can appreciate a little of my skepticism that widening 66 will reduce noise pollution in my neighborhood. My daughter's local elementary school, Stinwood, is located right next to the I-66 uh, interstate. At this moment, she's taking her annual standards of learning test this, today. The school was recently renovated, and I doubt that the noise abatement planning was accounted for in that renovation, it, especially if the 66 is wider. It's certainly not for the proposed flyover lanes, which arise above most sound abatement structures. Its fields will also likely be affected by the proposed land annexation, and it's possible that the school could lose its green fields to the gym and blacktop areas are the only areas for recess and PE options available to students. So I find it ridiculous that we can require private developers to create green space as part of development efforts, but we cannot do this when we develop roads. Southside Park along I-66 is where we enjoy our town uh, Fourth of July fireworks display and is a part of the affected area. I don't believe widening I-66 near Gallows will improve traffic on I-66. There's no metro service beyond Nutley, so as a result, all of that traffic is dumped onto the interstate. And I find it ridiculous that as one of the I-66 proposals that I've heard about would permanently eliminate metro expansion beyond Vienna. Sir, I would ask that, that's for your time, sir. Thank you very much for coming today. Uh, Mr. Whitaker. Sue Whitaker. Morning, sir. Morning, sir. Good morning. My name is Stuart M. Whitaker. I'm a financial economist by training, a businessman by experience, and the founder of Transitors.com, which is a transit users group. I was delighted with news reports of the analysis of financing alternatives, <clears throat> public versus private, or some combination thereof, announced and presented, according to these reports, by Secretary Lane here yesterday. I agree that it is the responsibility of the Commonwealth to pursue a strategy that is in the best interest of its citizens and uh, that the Commonwealth should not automatically choose one financing approach uh, or another. I also agree that this is an important matter deserving thorough and transparent review. But financing isn't the primary matter at hand, it's only a secondary matter. The primary matter is how do we isn't uh, how do we pay what we pay for what we buy. The primary matter is what in fact will we buy. We know a lot about transportation. Recent research has told us two new things about the role of transportation in our economy. First, researchers at the University of Chicago and the University of California at Berkeley have estimated that the quote housing crunch represents more than a $1 trillion annual drain on our economy and that high quality transit can play an important role in reducing that cost. Second, a recent study at Harvard found that commuting time is, quote, the single strongest factor in the odds of escaping poverty. 
The longer an average commute in a given county, the worse the chances of lower income families there moving up the ladder. The relationship between transportation and social mobility is stronger than that between social mobility and several other factors like crime, elementary school test scores, and the percentage of two-parent families in a community. So while the project financing alternatives, a matter of secondary importance, are being offered for careful examination and scrutiny, the actual project plan, which is of primary importance, has been presented as a fait accompli. Three general lanes, two toll lanes, with projected public transit ridership of only 10 percent. The plan is inconsistent with what we have learned from researchers at Chicago, Berkeley, and Harvard, and this approach is in stark contrast to the approach being followed concerning the project financing alternatives. I urge the CTB to pursue the same thorough and transparent approach to the I-66 plan as it is pursuing with respect to the I-66 project financing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that is all of the speakers that I have signed up. Is there anyone else that would like to uh, address the Commonwealth Transportation Board today in the public comment? Okay, seeing none, thank you all the speakers who did uh, speak this morning. We will make sure that any handout gets uh, to all the CTV members uh, to be read. We do very much appreciate your comment. So with this, then I'm going to now suspend the formal session, uh, and uh, we're going to go back into our um, uh, workshop session. So this is a formal suspension of the uh, action workshop and we will now continue uh, call into session the resumation of the workshop. Uh, what we're hoping to do is maybe get through uh, this uh, uh, the next half hour or so. We'll see how it goes. We do have one session we have to have, to have so we can vote on it in the work session. But Mr. Donahue, we'll have you come back up and I think where we left off was the, uh, the actual scoring of the slides. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, and members of the board. Just a refresher: we had talked about the top ten projects using the raw score. We had talked about the top ten projects using the relative score, looking at total cost. And we are kind of walking through this top ten here, where we looked at the HP2 cost, kind of uh, looking at the leveraging. And again, just as a reminder, where staff, uh, what we're really recommending to the board is that we not give you just one relative cost, either looking at a relative score, excuse me, looking at just total cost or HP2. As we've gone through this pilot exercise, we think both uh, items are of equal importance for the board because one just kind of tells you overall how effective, cost effective is this project, and the other kind of gives you a sense for whether or not we're able to leverage additional resources when we're considering that project, which is what the HP2 score gives you. And one of the things you're kind of, you know, highlighting here is this project number three. And I think this is just a really indicative project as the board thinks about the differences between raw score, cost effectiveness, and leverage score. This project on just a raw score basis is the 33rd out of 38. So it's in that bottom quartile of projects. You look at the relative benefit, it jumps up to 10. And so it's kind of in that second, you know, quarter of projects. And then when we consider whether or not we're leveraging local dollars, in this instance, local funds are paying for just over half of this project cost, it then actually goes up to five. And so it's in that top quarter or highest scoring quarter of projects. And so this just really is to demonstrate to you all the importance of looking at the relative cost, but also understanding the leverage, the leveraging of funds that can happen and how that's something we believe is of value for the board. Mr. Fraley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it's, we must point out that these scores were relative to the HB2 cost scores, were mostly revenue sharing and safety. Fire, fire, fire. That's correct. Right. Right. Um, once the regional monies play into this, these scores could drastically change. And um, I understand we've, we've decided to give you both, both give scores. both scores, so we punted a little bit uh, on that. But um, I do think that we need to pay attention to that as we go along because the HB2 score will be subject to manipulation. There's, there just will, and and we need we, and that's not necessarily bad. Thing. I mean, that can change a project to whether you build it or not, right? Because 
I mean, that's that's not necessarily a bad thing, but we need we need to pay attention to that. And so um, uh, I, I just wanted to raise that. Yep. And that's all, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. President, uh, just a clarification, following up Bill's statement. Uh, my understanding was the statute does not permit the regional taxes from being a part of the analysis. Is that is that correct, Nick? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Karzinski, I think what the statute says is that if the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority or the Hampton Roads Transportation Accountability Commission chooses to fully fund a project using the regional dollars, that project is exempt so. from being required to be analyzed under the House Bill 2 process. What it does not say is if they wish to co-fund a project with the state, how we would evaluate the relative benefit of that project from a cost perspective. And I think from staff's perspective, there's, we, have, we have two minds, and we think they're equally important. And so the first is really understanding what is the total cost benefit of this project, because at the end of the day, taxpayers in some form are in fact paying that cost. All the dollars government has to invest come from taxpayers at different levels of government or through tolls. On the other hand here, we also think we want to encourage the co-investment of local dollars, regional dollars, and federal funds under the control of regional entities with the state where we can so that we can leverage more resources into projects the state believe is worthwhile to invest in. And that's why looking at the House Bill 2 relative cost benefit, we think is also very important for the state to consider. May I follow up on that? Just, just 66, for example. How are we going to treat, if we do a PPTA that requires some public subsidy, the total cost and the HB2 cost? Because the total cost, in that sense, is not going to be uh, Mr. Chairman, and the Mr. payback Craig, is, I guess you could look at it that way. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so the way we, just speaking offhand and, you know, subject to thinking about this more, but just a quick reaction there is there would be two scores. One would be the raw score divided by $2.1 billion, and the other would be the raw score depending on which procurement option the Commonwealth chooses divided by whatever that remaining public upfront funding is. And so the PPTA will have to go through House Bill 2 as well? Uh, the project does, yeah. It's got federal, it's got, uh, uh, Mr. Duggan <laughs> mentioned it, we need to, it needs to be scored. Right. Any project that takes statewide, state monies, mm -hmm. has to be scored. Right. Any, if it's one dollar on it, it's got to be scored. Well, Mr. Chairman, yeah. with the, the emphasis that you rightfully placed on the process, how does HB 2 and the analysis of 66 uh, correlate to the process you've created because it would seem that until we do HB2 and we're assuming that it's going to score well, but until it scores, are your hands tied? I mean, that's yeah. Well, that's why it was important where I had uh, Director Mitchell and Charlie to do, we give us a project to score. I don't mean that to. Uh -huh. I mean we, that was it. We, we could not go down a path until we had a project to score. I think we have enough information now to have a project to score uh, in that in, 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 because we've gone through this process, and I know some of the public got uh, uh, you know. The, as we went through the NEPA process and just looking, bearing it down. But yes, you're, it, now I don't think it's going to curtail us because I think we have the information now We can, as our scoring comes up that we can score. But yes, we have to score uh, 66, both inside and outside the belt. We have to be scored. Uh, the other thing, Mr. Chairman, going back to the slides here is I think you see a greater uh, you see all four area types again recognized when we're looking at the relative benefit either from total cost or HP2 cost, both in the top ten as well as in the bottom ten here. And so I know again uh, Mr. Whitworth referenced kind of the raw scores and what he said is 100 percent right about that raw score. What we've seen though is a lot of the projects that we evaluate under C and D tended to be a little less costly in some of the projects in the A and B category types. And so that's created a greater mix kind of throughout this 38. Again, I can't promise that when we score all the projects this fall and winter, it's going to turn out with the, you know, the same kind of mix we happen to have this time. But I do think this shows you that as it's currently structured, staff don't think there's a bias towards any particular area type. But Mr. Rose, we are going to keep looking at category B there just to make sure um, that's not true. Ms. Um, this is more of an, <clears throat> an observation. I'm wondering if it's true that as the revenue sharing 
project, um, program is going to be phased out or diminished um, over the next few years. Localities, or could localities contribute to a project? Sure. And that would, you know, so that allows them to participate. So it many, actually... Many localities do. <coughs> so they're able to, to project you know, so it makes them more competitive than the yeah. HP2 Mr. Chairman, Mr. Valentine, that was exactly the intent of showing that HP2 cost, because right. in a way, if they choose to co-invest with yeah. the state, they can make at least one of their project scores uh, yeah, higher doesn't. by virtue of that investment. It doesn't have to be you know, revenue sharing. I mean, if they want to contribute other monies, too. So uh, I think we'll see that mix, but that's exactly right. It, you know, if we can, uh, as Ms. Brillis said, well, they think they can put 20% of the cost up and it makes the score better. Why wouldn't we want them to do it? And, you know, I was just asking for the clarification because there is a concern among some localities that, you know, without revenue sharing, there has not been access to transportation dollars. And, in fact, this is, this is another way for them to do it, even as the revenue sharing program goes down. So, Mr. Chairman, members of the uh, I'm just curious, what, what does the score have to be for the project to move forward? Uh, Mr. Malvin, the score has to be whatever the board thinks it needs to be to move forward. That's not something as staff I can tell you. That the scores are going to be the scores, and um, as the Secretary has pointed out several times, you know, let's go to the the lowest scoring project here has a uh, relative benefit of total cost of 0 0.03. I guess the score has to be that or higher in this particular pilot round because you can fund any project that you choose to. Again, I expect the you know, real impetus behind this process, so there's several, but one of the main ones is the transparency and accountability. So the public's going to know that's what that score is if you choose to fund the lowest scoring project. And I suspect just as we a lot of people commenting today on, you know, projects we're considering, I expect if the board funded the lowest scoring project, we'd have a lot of members in other parts of the public, excuse me, show up in other parts of the state and say, I want to know why you did this. Your own analysis says this is the lowest scoring project that you could have funded. So uh, moving forward, where we are today is we have taken notes of all the kind of remaining issues that the board members have raised. Um, you know, some of those key ones are the weighting of congestion and land use in the Category A frameworks. We also are going to try and work in reliability into the economic development measure. And there are two or three other things that I took notes on yesterday that are on the top of my head now. What we would ask of uh, from the members is that in the next two, you know, four or five days, please email me with any other remaining issues that you have with this, what we're going to do as staff is go back and kind of take those into account and send you a week or so after those five days kind of a, the process you'll be asked to vote on in June, taking into account these final remaining concerns um, that we've heard. And again, as the chairman has stressed, this isn't the end. We're going to keep, as staff, looking at the wording to make sure that we can fine-tune it. We're going to keep testing stuff. We're going to figure out ways to try and, you know, make sure that you can score these projects faster and do other things. It really kind of creates a pivot point for us internally to move from development to implementation, which I think is something we need to have so that Commissioner Kilpatrick and Director Mitchell staff can go out, can work with the local governments, tell them with certainty this is going to be the process, kind of the first round, so that they we have you know projects to analyze and score, and local governments really understand <coughs> what they should be putting in this October, or excuse me, August and September, so that we can score them, you know, through the winter. And some of the projects that we have defunded, you know, in the plan, those are developed projects that will be scored. But that doesn't mean they're the only ones. There could be other projects that should be scored, too. So. I have uh, one question I've been holding until the end here. I think we're, we're, we've reached it. Have we changed the policy about the uh, CTB members able to present a project for scoring? What, what, what we, ha we have not adopted a policy. What we've recommended is, is that uh, there would be an opportunity for a CT, you know, whether it's one or two projects a year right. for the CTB member to make a, uh, a, um, uh, you know, a proposal he'd like to have. Uh, and if there's five or six, we may take a vote on which one or two we want to put in in there. I, I think we did hear loud and clear, and it gets back to scoring and in the independence and the whole bit. I do think we have to reserve the right if we think there's a project that's just been missed to reserve the right to, to, to put one in. I mean, I, I, there's a board in that. 
On the other hand, I don't think it should be just, you know, it is us that are putting the projects in. No, I, I agree with that. I just want to make sure there was there, there's the a resolution. draft. There was no opportunity for that. And now, I yeah, yeah, sure we, we, yes, we put that. We've reserved the right now. Uh, I, I don't expect them to be. 14 of them put in. <laughs> in other words, everybody, but I do expect if we think, and that would, I think it would be subject to the board saying, yeah, that's one we should score. I agree. I agree. Mr. Wentworth? Um, will the districts uh, have the capability of uh, stress testing a potential project to the score to know how they might want to? Uh, format that project, to, uh, in, in other words, will they have the capacity to know pretty much what a project will score before it's officially presented? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Whitworth, I think what a district will have the ability to do is to understand the aggregate benefits, but again, the score is based, is relative, mm -hmm. based on the other projects that get right. submitted by different localities in that district or other regional entities across the Commonwealth, and so they won't be able to say, on the congestion score, are we going to be closer to 100 or to zero? But they will be able to say, we think we can reduce this many hours of person delay and increase person throughput by this much. The thing that they're not going to know is what are the other potential projects elsewhere in the state that might get submitted. So they'll be able to do some analysis, but um, they won't be able to kind of give it that raw type of score that we see today because they'll need to know every other project in the Commonwealth to be able to do that. Well, I was thinking in terms of uh a decision that has to be made on a local basis. We're going to need to put X amount of money into this thing if we want to have a decent score. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Worth, I think what they'll be able to do is, you know, the staff will be able to work with them on the crash modification factors and tell them, well, if you actually add this change to your project, that will increase your safety score. Or if you, we think right now the way this is designed, you might be able to t more ta narrowly tailor that design. Excuse me. You know, this component isn't really necessary, and that can reduce the cost by a million dollars, which will increase your score. So I think they can really help them on the projects. The thing I want to be clear that I don't think they'll be able to do it with certainty. They're not going to be able to tell them exactly what to do with the project or exactly how it's going to score. But again, as we talked earlier, as this process goes on and on, the, it's the same way VDOT works with the local staff down at the boat. They'll understand. They're already beginning, to, because we've included a lot of VDOT uh, in, in this analysis, they're beginning to understand how to shape the projects. You know, and not, not just for scoring, but quite frankly, I think inherent in this is also what they, you know, you use the money's wisely. And that, so, you, uh, Mr. Mall, how long is it going to take to score a project? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Malbin, we are going to make it take less time than it took this time when we have more <laughs> projects the next time. Uh, it, it took too long this time, but it was also, you know, we are going through this the first time. We found out some of our, you know, uh, questions weren't written narrowly enough, so we got too many wide range of options. The pilot testing is really going to help us create a more streamlined scoring process in the future. We still have to do some more work on, you know, the GIS tool and some other things. Um, it's, it's going to take some time, um, and it's going to take some staff resources, uh, but we are going to make sure that there's a QAQC process built in. We're probably going to try and uh, recommend to you all that we use two to three teams, probably three teams, to score this, which should allow a lot more concurrent uh, work to move forward. This time it was literally Chad and you know four other people who did the bulk of this scoring. And I, th I think we need four people or several teams of Chad and four people doing that scoring for this to be a more efficient process and for us to have the time for QAQC and to allow the locals to see those scores as we move forward. So uh, it, it is a burden, um, but we're working to make it less of one. But at the same time, I think it's very important. And it's going to cost some money, but I think it's important that we do this as we look at how to spend the $800 million that's available. Okay, so we've gotten through uh, what we'll be doing in June uh, is uh, adopting this uh, format uh, that Nick will then move into scoring, and then uh, I'm sure we'll have updates as that's going, but when we have it, I plan to have a, whether it's an all-day or two-day, whatever, a planning session where we all meet uh, and review the scores and have, you know, give and take back and forth as to how uh, that uh, if that's working the way it was envisioned, and that. 
Hey, Mr. Chairman, real quick before I sit down, I just want to remind you, we, uh, in addition to Steve Pittard's presentation on the TISDAC recommendations, we do have two individuals who flew in today to talk about the Northern Virginia TDM plan, if we can try and work that. I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. I can't hear you. We have two. I'm sorry. This computer talking the microphone. Uh, in addition to Mr. Pittard's presentation, we do have two individuals who flew in yeah. to present to the board today. And I just want to yeah, uh, and I'm, that's what I was going to get to. The, uh, we're going to go through uh, uh, that. Uh, but I want to make sure we were uh, finished up here with House Bill 2. So uh, there are two that we have to get through, the tiered capital allocation review, because that's going to be voted on. Um, and then we have a group here, uh, uh, as Mr. Uh, Donahue pointed out. Uh, why don't we uh, entertain, let's have this on the big data. Yeah, why don't we do that now? Um, and so that way they can uh, go on the, their way or, uh, or uh, not hold them up anymore since they flew in directly for this. And after that, we'll then uh, either take a quick break for lunch or see where Mr. Pittard is, depending uh, on how long this takes. Morning. Secretary Lane and members of the board, uh, thanks for having us this morning. We're delighted to be here, not only because we both have roots to the Commonwealth. Laura was born here, and my daughter was born here when I lived here for about 20 years. Uh, but because this is a really exciting project, uh, and I hope you'll be as excited about it once we describe it to you as, as we are. It's really, I think, something that is going to be nationally significant as well as significant to Northern Virginia and the Commonwealth. Laura will follow up. Um, we think we'll get through with this in about 15 minutes and have a time for questions if, if that's about right for you. So uh, my name is Eric Sundquist. I work at the University of uh, Wisconsin on a project we call the State Smart Transportation Initiative. It's about a five-year-old project. It engages state DOTs and <coughs> transportation officials from around the country on a volunteer basis. We don't have all 50 states, but we really want the states that are interested in making change and um, so we have a self-selected bunch, including Virginia. This is a little out of date. We now have Florida. Um, but we convene folks around best practices, and we do some technical assistance, and we also have uh, webinars and so forth on our website, which is SSTI.us. Great, and thank you for having us as well. I'm Laura Shul. I'm the CEO of Streetlight Data. We are a big data analytics company that creates data assets to analyze mobility behavior to help policymakers, engineering providers, and all sorts of other actors understand what is happening on a transportation network and implement policy that is better for that deeper understanding. So what we do is we pull data from, uh, I think now, 125 million mobile devices across the U.S. As you know, as you're carrying around mobile devices, it's doing a lot of locational things. It's pinging GPS to get you directions to where you need to go. It's pinging locations so you can you know, look up the nearest restaurant. In addition, most new vehicles now have geolocated services within them. We are taking that data. We are anonymizing it. We're bringing it together from many different sources, and we're using that to understand more deeply than ever was available before what's happening on the ground. So the slide you see before you is just a few minutes of data. I believe we're in Prince William County. Just the raw stuff, as you can see, the data from the vehicles is collecting very clearly on the roads. You can begin to see the off-ramps. You can begin to see the four patterns of mobility. And that's the raw data that we're going to use to create some of the really innovative and powerful metrics that we're going to show you in just a few minutes. Great. So the project that we're working on now is focused on Northern Virginia. Um, I'm going to just give you a brief outline on it so you have sort of a sense of what it is we're talking about, and then we'll kind of back up and deal with some of the concepts. But uh, we're going to focus on the demand side of uh, the equation, uh, we are going to, which for, for the present purposes is almost anything that isn't a big highway or transit passing. So everything else is on the table. Um, 
Following on some of the HB2 conversation, we're going to focus on accessibility. Um, so that's trip making and where people are trying to go, what their origins and destinations are, rather than just speed on a, a road segment corridor, which is part of accessibility, but only part. Uh, we're going to focus on personal trip making. We could look at commercial vehicles and freight and that sort of thing, but this is really to focus and have a, a meaningful project here, we're going to eliminate some of that. Um, but one aspect of that is that um, some transportation planning, my background is in transportation planning, um, you have these large regional models and you often look at long distance trips and you're trying to facilitate mobility across long distances. But one of the motiv motivating factors here is that every time somebody goes from an origin to destination, that's utility for them. That is, you know, they're getting to work or they're getting to the store or whatever. And if they go one mile or 10 miles or 100 miles to do that, it's still a trip. It's still the same utility. And so one of the things that sometimes gets overlooked are those short trips, both the value of them and sometimes the cost of them. So I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean on that. Um, as Laura alluded to, and her firm is going to be helping us on this, we're going to be using big data-driven analytics um, that sur surmount some of the boundaries that we've had in terms of dealing with synthetic models and old-fashioned uh, diary-collected travel information or no information at all. Um, and then we're going to use this data as a really integral part of uh, our outreach. So it's going to, um, there's a lot of people already doing TDM and all kinds of things in Northern Virginia. Um, we're going to engage them with this data, which is not just going to be a report that plunks out and says, here are the 10 things you should do. Um, now, uh, just the, the remainder of this is going to, I'm going to take number one here and really talk about the TDM and a little bit more about the concepts that we're trying to explore. Laura is going to then talk about the data part, and then we just, we'll talk just at the end. We don't know what our, exactly what our results are going to be, obviously, but we can sort of generalize about them and then talk a little bit about some benefits that are going to come out of this that aren't just about TDM. And so, so why the demand side? And I, it sounds like from the discussion you guys were having this morning that you were um, pretty well steeped in, in this issue. So I'm not going to like go on and on about it. But in our field, we usually deal with supply supplies. You know, more capacity, um, whether it's whatever mode. Um, but and, and now we're moving into managed lanes and so forth that are, are a form of TDM. But basically, supply alone is just a free lunch. The, we don't price it, you know, adequately, and the price signals aren't very transparent. And it's like a free buffet. You put it all out, and people consume a lot. Of it. Um, so TDM is a little bit of a way to countervail that. So maybe instead of taking, you know, you, you arrange the buffet so that uh, uh, you don't have to pay for 50 pounds of steak every time somebody shows up, but maybe they take some potatoes and some cheap things too, as far as a, uh, maybe that's a strained analogy, but as far as it's um, The slide here is from Oregon, where they used a, an analysis coming out of the utility industry, um, where the utility industry in the 90s found that providing megawatts or demand solutions was cheaper than new power plants and transmission lines in some cases. And so it's an attempt to match up costs of supply. You see on the left, you see transit roadway capacity. Um, and on the right, you see um, bike pad and TDM programs. Uh, they all score pretty well in terms of meeting people's needs. But in terms of cost benefit, TDM and active transportation, they found were the low hanging fruit. So um, that is one of the reasons that we're focusing on that. We can talk more about that. Questions if you know, it's clear. TDM, again, it, we are using an expansive version of it, not just the sort of traditional TDM programs you might have heard that are based on employees giving out bus passes and things like that, although that is part of it. So I'm going to talk briefly about three sort of big bins of TDM uh, policies or practices that we might we might uh, recommend or find are beneficial in this analysis. One is, the, is exactly what I was just talking about, the traditional TDM um, program that large employers have where they give discounted bus passes or carpool parking, 
uh, bike lockers and that sort of thing. Expanding that a little bit, uh, looking into parking availability and pricing, one of the, it's one of the strongest sort of drivers of whether people choose to drive or, or not, is whether parking is free and just how it's allocated. The new sharing economy um, and the availability of bike or car share or Uber and that sort of thing. Um, and land use, and we're not going to, that opens a huge window, but we don't want to ignore it. Land use obviously has a lot to do with um, how much people need to drive uh, and what modes they take, and so we're going to at least be cognizant of that. I don't think it'll be, it won't be a full land use study because we're really focusing on the transportation piece. We're not going to ignore it either. Um, connectivity is... Um, Another issue, and Laura will get at how we're going to look at this, but this is this is something that I just did off of Google Maps as a, an example. Uh, from a house um, just outside the Beltway to Falls Church High School, which is in this district where, the, if you were in high school, where you would go, is about a three-mile walk by the network that we have today. But it's under a mile if you, as pro flies. So we're going to be looking, that has a number of, uh, outcomes. Obviously, probably you're not going to walk. You're going to drive. And if you're 14, you're going to have to get somebody to drive. You know? And if you're driving at rush hour, because school starts at rush hour, you're going to be on the system at the same time everybody else is trying to get to work. And so not only is there a burden on you, but you're burdening the system too. Um, and it's not that if we created this pro flies or something like it that you would necessarily walk, but you might. You might. You might take a bike or you might drive a lot less. So connectivity and uh, the concept of circuity of trips and where the short trips are going is important in this analysis. And finally, first and last mile solutions. It's um, how easy is it to get to transit or to get to wherever you're going from transit. It's a particular case of using sharing that I mentioned before. Uh, that's often the first and last mile solution, but that might not be the only thing. It might be the availability of parking at park and ride. It might be how's the bike pad network connected to transit and that sort of thing. So those, are, those aren't the exhaustive list of policies and practices we're going to look at, but they're sort of exemplary in three of the main ones. And finally, um, I'm going to segue to Laura, but a uh, question about why, why do this now. Uh, one I've already alluded to is TDM has tended to not be emphasized in our field uh, as opposed to supply, even though it's cheaper and has a number of benefits. The second thing is, which we'll, Laura will really go into, is the new methods that we have now, and the ability to uh, really think about this in a different way. The, the fan chart or the, um, the, the chart on the left on the slide is um, repeatedly modeled demand estimates for the nation. And they're rolled up from states and, uh, and put together by the federal government. You can see year after year we have the same basic slope and estimate. The actual demand for highway travel is in the black line. So we've been, our models are not very accurate. Uh, and now we have an ability to, to transcend or augment the models with some empirical data that's very helpful. And just looking at this table on the right, that's what North Carolina DOT did. They had a bypass project that they were planning. Um, and then they went and looked at trip making in the area and found that 50% um, of the, trip was come, or the trips were going in and out. A third were circulating in the area downtown that they were trying to bypass, and only 13 14% were through trips, and so the bypass was really not a very good option. Very expensive, would have chewed up a lot of land and cost a lot, but they backed off. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Laura to talk about a little bit more about the data. Absolutely. So I'm going to talk a bit about the data, and then I ran some preliminary analysis to give you three examples within Northern Virginia to help us all get a little more concrete about what it is we're going to be doing. So this big data solution is not a robot that tells you what to invest in, and that's very important to get out in front. Um, instead, it is a way to make people who are making decisions, who are communicating with stakeholders, it's a way to make them more effective at what they do. It's also not a panopticon or a crystal ball that lets you see perfectly everything that's happening now and in the future. It's, again, a very good tool that can drastically increase the speed, the effectiveness, uh, the level of communication by which you 
Well, it's also a very good tool for education and communication, which wasn't the initial reason we started looking at big data solutions for planning, but has been a really great co-benefit. Because these visualizations help explain complex trends very quickly, very effectively. Um, and again, one of the greatest things it can do is speed things up. Instead of waiting to find out when problems are happening, we can scan, and we will scan, all of Northern Virginia to look for particular patterns that lend themselves to cost-effective and community-effective solutions. And the last thing, which isn't on the slide, but I know it was discussed earlier today, is we're also doing a special analysis on this, on the income differential in transportation patterns we're going to be measuring. So it will allow us to dig into measuring some of the equity implications that, as we've heard, has been historically difficult to get at. So a lot of co-benefits on top of the core purpose of this project. So uh, Nick talked about, uh, sorry, Eric talked about demand solutions, last mile solutions, and uh, connectivity. So I'm going to give you three concrete examples of how we measure each of those. So what you're seeing on the map um, is an analysis on a particular road segment in uh, just south of the Beltway, I believe. So the little road segment is in yellow on your slide. And what I did is I analyzed for traffic in that road segment during congested hours for things that start in that uh, transportation analysis zone up top that says origin, where is it going? Simple question, but historically extremely difficult to answer. And we see that it's going all over the place, but there's a cluster of trips going to the lower red zone. What that tells us is that's a good opportunity for TDM. So this pair of transportation analysis zones, uh, it's less than five kilometers or three miles. So that means we could look at mitigating congestion in that segment and say, hey, there are a lot of short trips on this. That means that a certain set of options might be more feasible than others. Maybe this is good for some sort of parallel bike trail. Maybe this is great for a circular shuttle, that's sort of a, a quick rotating thing. Um, what it may not be good for, you do not want to put a whole new subway system to connect to things that are only five kilometers apart. So that's an example of big data helping us be effective in triaging what we can do with our time and our money. And it also is good for communicating clearly with the people who would be affected by any policies that we put in. So another example, this is the same road segment, but now I looked at trips that started way up in Arlington. Where do they go? What's interesting is they tend to be going very far away. So another segment of congestion on this road segment is not this short distance, it's very long distance. Uh, no way anybody's going to bike that. So instead, if we're looking at mitigating this other chunk of congestion, this says you want to be thinking about buses, you want to be thinking about van pools, you want to be thinking about carpooling incentives, very different set of demand management policies to get at this chunk of the traffic. And if you do put in those policies, I can give you very good recommendations on where the nodes of those bus or shuttle systems should be. If there's a stop up here in this origin zone, the most popular destination will probably be right around here. And that's a great way to make a better bet on the policies or the shuttles or whatever it is that you put in. So again, an example of not a robot telling you what to do, but a tool helping you make triaged, effective decisions. So this is an example um, of Tyson's, where we are right now. This map shows for each of the road segments up here, for trips driving on them, are the trips pretty straight, uh, crows flying type trips, or are they very indirect? Are they looping around, going out of their way? So if the zones are orange, it's a very loopy trip. Um, and if it's green or yellow, it's a more straight trip. And so what this tells us is uh, it helps us scan for places where we might have some connectivity issues, where not just is it hard to get from place A to place B, but do the people in place A, are they trying to get to that place that's hard to get to? Um, so what we see is that people who come into the Tyson's Mall take indirect trips, which is not surprising since the mall has a ring road. Now this is an example of when uh, you need to apply some local judgment and why this is a tool to enhance local judgment. We are not going to build a through road through the mall. That is a bad example of a connectivity policy. <laughs> However, if you look at the upper right corner, um, there's this sort of residential to commercial access road up here that's also orange. If we could zoom out of the map, you see that they have a very hard time getting on the highway to get to where they want to go. Sometimes they just want to go underneath, but they have to go up and down the highway and through. That might be a good opportunity for some extra connectivity uh, dollars or thinking to be put in. So my last example is in last mile uh, solutions, as Eric mentioned. So I've analyzed the Burke Center Park and Ride in Fairfax, um, which is a park and ride that we know uh, in Northern Virginia. The park and rides are great, but they tend to get full pretty early in the morning. So what you may want to do to increase the usage of this transit station is get other have other ways to get people to the station. 
So then you would want to know, maybe we're going to have a shuttle, maybe we'll have bike lanes. Should they be to the north or the south, or the east and the west? And what this map tells us very clearly is it's an east-west trajectory that you want to focus on, possibly a little more to the east, which is interesting because that means people are sort of moving away from D.C. to get on transit to go back to D.C. So you also may want to look at uh, connectivity to the next station in and how the parking affects that. So again, this is a tool that helps us target our efforts to enhance usage of this facility and make it more useful for the locals. Also, these are reasonably short trips. So again, we may be in an opportunity where trails, uh, circular shuttles might be a good option. So those are my three examples. Uh, Eric, do you want to go over briefly the outreach plan? I think we're running along. So I think the only thing we want to stress here is that there's going to be a lot of it. We've already had an initial meeting with some uh, TDM providers and locals in uh, even before we have the notice to proceed. But we, if you see the slide, we have several check-in points and conversation points built into the project. And then this is the last thing. We just want to stress that this is not only going to produce the raw material for better TDM in Northern Virginia, but as, as we sort of tried to get, is going to help us get the get better at being thoughtful, looking at trip making and not just, you know, speed on segments. Um, it's going to help us look at equity and, and social questions like that. It's going to produce some new visualizations that we can use to get stakeholders better involved. And um, I didn't mention this before, but a lot of the material that Laura is getting out of GPS can go back into traditional models, which you still need to figure out what's going to go, what's going to happen when you change a project. We still need some projection capacity, but we can improve that and improve performance of those models with some of this empirical data that wasn't available. So with that, I think we'll pause and see if there are any questions. Thank you for your presentation. Mr. Connor. Uh, this is great, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you all for the presentation. Thank you, Nick. Um, when are we going to incorporate this in HB2? I mean, I'd like to have in my region right now to look at some projects um, and maybe figure out a way to redesign them, shave some costs, spread well, some money. Well, uh, part of HB2 as it goes to, is to look at these type and you get in, in, in more, uh, to say, points. It's incentivized to use these type of strategies in the project. So I'll let Mr. Donahue well, expand on that. The numbers we're looking at now, the six year plan we're looking at now, is based on data. That's old data that may or may not be valuable, which is driving up the cost of projects and doing all kinds of things. So how, when does this all incorporate? So, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Connors, um, I've, I've asked these folks to work with the local representatives as well as some of the uh, BDOT and DRPT staff in this region to have some uh, initial results and analysis available by September, which would still be in the application process if some of the local communities or the regionals want to send in this project. Um, I do think we need to do more planning like this, and the reason I really wanted to give Eric and Laura the opportunity to present before you is we couldn't do this just four years ago. This type of analysis, when we try to figure out where people are actually going, uh, a long time ago we had people stand on the side of the road and write down license plates, and then you send them questionnaires and said, at 4 o'clock on Friday, where were you going? <laughs> and people said, well, I don't know which Friday you were talking about, but I think I was going to the burger joint. Um, and, you know, sometimes they were right and sometimes they were wrong. Now, when people use Google Maps with all the GPS-enabled things, and this is all anonymous data just for anyone thinking about the privacy aspects of that, we know exactly when they started traveling and we know exactly where they went and we know how long it took them and we know where it got slowed down. And that type of analysis has really only been available, or data, excuse me, has really only been available for the last two or three years. And so this is hopefully the first of several efforts we'll be doing in the state level looking at this. Um, I do want to stress, as Eric said, again, this isn't going to be the solution for everything. We need capacity in a lot of places, but what this is going to help us do is understand where there might be lower cost options to solve some of these problems or to help us augment the capacity that we're putting in place. Um, but, Mr. Connors, we will be doing more of this, and this stuff should be available by mid to late September. All right, well, thank you very much uh, for your presentation today and uh, hope you have safe travels uh, going through. All right, uh, what I'd like to do now is continue with, uh, there's a couple of things that we're just going to make announcements on and then I'm going to get to the tiered capital allocation review. Um, Mr. Let's see, Mr. Lawson, are you here? 
Yes. Yeah. Maybe you can just come up and, 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 and you and Mr. Pitter can just uh, direct the board as to where to look for the information in your presentations. I think you guys can review it. I don't think we need to have an actual presentation. So. Yes, uh, Mr. Secretary, members of the board, uh, before you, you have um, copies, dr draft copies of the CTF and the VDOT budgets, um, historically, or I should say in over the last four or five years, I have not provided you with a draft budget. You've never seen a budget until it was put, brought to you just before the, the June meeting. Uh, what I wanted to do this this year was to get you a draft budget that is that supports the uh, the six year program that you received in draft form last month to give you an opportunity to to see the budget to see how it's structured how it's laid out and what's included and uh, I'll be more than glad to ask any answer any questions you may have as you review it um, between now and the meeting in June and you will be provided you know a, a formal final copy of the budget um, at the June meeting for action. Right. Thank you. Uh, and so you'll be getting that obviously before then too. But this gives you a whole month to look at the budget in that. And Mr. Fair, I assume that's the same in DRPT. Yeah, the exact same thing. Usually, y'all are getting this in uh, early June or mid mid June, about a week before the board meeting where you're voting on it. As John indicated, we thought it'd be a good idea to get it to you sooner, so you had more time. So, since we didn't get to present uh, at the meeting. Uh, this month, we're both open for questions, either email or give us a phone call. Okay, now while you're up there, Mr. Chair, why don't you just go on into the tiered capital allocation review because that's going to be voted on in our action session. Uh, and I want to get, get, take us through that. And, and while um, Steve's pulling up the presentation, I'd just like to re um, remind everybody what this is about. Um, in uh, 2012, the, there was a um, some legislation that directed DRPT to change the way that we allocate both our operating and our capital funds. And so working with um, the, the TISDAC, the Transit Service Delivery and Advisory Committee, of which um, Mr. Cole is also a member, um, DRPT came up with a recommended uh, some new formulas. And that was then adopted by the CTB in December of 2013. And I know many of you weren't here at the time, but a few of you were. Um, we had a lot of, there were a lot of concerns raised at the times by various stakeholders who were concerned about disproportionate impacts of that change in the formula. So the CTB directed DRPT to conduct an analysis of the, um, of these formulas and then come back to the CTB with recommendations on how it's working. So we've gone through that analysis and that, that's what Steve is going to be presenting here uh, today. So we do need to act on this during the action meeting as well. Um, and so, Ms. Pitt, I would ask you to go through many of these slides are just what she, uh, Ms. Mitchell has already said, so i just go through them relatively quickly and get to the heart of the matter uh, for the CTB members to uh, look at, okay? Sure, no problem. Okay. Um, and this first slide, uh, Jennifer's really taking care of this. It, it's just the actual wording from the resolution back in December of 2013 where there was some controversy when we made this change to these formulas, and so y'all asked us to take a look after we implemented it and determined if there was any jurisdictions that suffered a financial loss, um, and if so, should we provide transitional assistance. Um, and so that's what we set out to do with the review. Was we, 2015 was the first year of implementing the new process. Um, so we wanted to quantify the impact of the change in the funding level and then also the change in that allocation method on each jurisdiction. Also, I do think we should make note that uh, we did this work. We came up with recommendations. It was presented to the TISDAC uh, uh, last month, which is the Transit Service Del Delivery Advisory Committee, and both Mr. Cole and now Mr. Dyke are on that committee. Um, and the committee actually, I, I'll get to the recommendations at the end, but the committee uh, recommended unanimously our recommendations. And I'm going to go through a lot of this uh, pretty quickly uh, at a high level. So in doing our review, there were some constant assumptions. Uh, one of the constant assumptions is we took the 2015 capital program as is. We didn't change it. We left the federal funding um, as was allocated in the 2015 six-year program. 
What did change was for WMATA and VRE, we had to allocate their allocations of funding. We had to essentially divide that out by the different benefiting jurisdictions. And then for the, so we have actually what we did, and then we said, okay, what would we have done if we had not made these changes? What would have happened? And without going into all the detail here, that's essentially what this is. It's going back to the prior methodology and saying, without the new money and without changing the methodology, what would have happened? And this touches really on what Jennifer had mentioned. There was a change. We got more funding, essentially. And part of getting more funding out of HB 2313 back in the 2013 session, part of that was we needed to put some performance around our allocation and some of the tiering over our capital allocation process. This just at a high level, it takes, I can go in more detail if you'd like, but this really is the actual formulas. So it's the top one here is the old formula, and the bottom is the new methodology that you all adopted back in December of 13. This is the actual summary of the allocations made in 2015 for the capital transit program, and it breaks it down by the three different tiers that the board adopted. And now finally we get to sort of a breakdown of, at a high level, the old process if you took the 2015 projects and ran them through that process. And at that point there were different tiers, and another point was the actual cost of the project that we applied our matching percentage, whether it was the total cost of the project or the non-federal share of the project. This slide gives some relative, a range of variation of the allocation percentages that you all make towards transit capital projects under both the old methodology and the new methodology. And I think the main point I want to make here is on the very bottom line, the main item that has a significant change, it's really the lowest tier of prioritization that you all set. And the other point here is not everybody either puts 80% federal on a project or zero. There's a lot of the dollars of the capital program actually have a number somewhere in the middle of federal funding. And finally, this slide actually, it shows the analysis of comparing the actual 2015 to the 2000, to the prior methodology using the old level of funding. And it shows that everyone did receive more funding, all the jurisdictions as well as this is broken down by CTV district. And this slide just reiterates what I just said and gives a few percentages around that. And finally, there are a few other observations that I think are important to note as we move forward. You know, first, we just looked at 2015 and within 2015, that's a one year application period. So one grantee may have only applied for vehicles in that year and then their capital allocations would have just been in tier one. Whereas the year before, they may have had no vehicle purchases and all their allocations might have been in tier two and three. And the point I'm making there is that would have skewed whether they were perceived to receive a bigger financial gain or a little bit less of a financial gain. Also, I think it's important to recognize, you know, this change did have an impact. So it did change, you know, when you change any methodology, it does have some impact versus, but with the new funding, I think at the end of the day, everyone did receive more money financially. So is in any process or methodology change, you can always come back later and question. And I think that's the final bullet here is really one of the recommendations 
from the TSDAC was to continue to look at this process. And, in fact, it's in the code that the TSDAC is required every three years to take a look at these allocation procedures. So the bottom line is you're suggesting keep the same allocation and we'll look at it again in three years. Second bullet, no transitional assistance is needed, and we currently recommend maintaining the current methodology. Okay. Questions of Mr. Pitter? Mr. Dyke? Yeah. Just one observation. I think when the committee met, we also talked about the fact, even though it was referenced here that we're supposed to review this every three years, that we would be continuously monitoring this to see if there were any changes in need for any adjustments, which would bring back CTB. Right. And I'll add to that that we put that type of language in the resolution you'll be voting on, that there will be a constant review process. But no need to bring back CTB unless there's a recommended change. Yeah, unless they want to recommend a change, you'll bring it to the CTB. Okay. I think, Mr. Pitter, thank you very much. I think next up we have Ms. Julie Brown, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about primary expansions. Here, there's Julie. I do want to provide you an update of our application process this year, and I'm just going to really hit the highlights of this, recognizing that we're a little short on time. Right. And I'll go to this slide just to explain a proposal we have for you this year. This year was a little unusual. We had six applications submitted initially with requests for $1.2 million. We actually have an allocation of $1.4 million. This is in contrast to last year. Last year we had $212,000, and we had two applications that were tied. So those two counties received $106,000 of their request for $300,000. So the first two projects you see listed are the two counties that received a partial allocation last year. We are proposing this year, since we do have more money than we have request, that we allow those two counties that were impacted last year to have their request for last year not count against their $300,000 limit for this year. That would really only impact one county, and that is Loudoun County. Loudoun County, their initial request of $194,000, if we allow that to count as completing last year's request, they could still make a request for a full $300,000 this year. And that would be within our budget, so we are proposing that. The other thing I will point out is on our primary extensions. This year we had 101 applications that were scored. We had requests of $22.6 million, and we had funding of $9.6 million. So we are proposing that, in addition to using this year's funding, that we also use half of the funds available for next year, because each of these applications represent payments that are deficient today. And if we were to use half of next year's allocation, $5.9 million, that would bring the funding available up to $15.5 million, and that would ensure that every district does have at least some of their urban deficient pavements paved this year based on the requests that we have. And especially with the passage of 1887 and looking at state of good repair, it just made sense to me that we took some of next year's funds and brought them forward, because these roads aren't going to get any better over that period of time. And the reality is the budget impact, because of the schedule of this work, the budget impact will not be felt until the fiscal year that the money is coming from. But, again, we thought it was important that they would move forward with these, because at the end of the day, our deficient payments are statewide, whether they're on our system or on the local system. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Just a general question to understand completely, Mr. Commissioner, what you're saying. General question, what happens when we get to that fiscal year and you've got half the money for that year available? Do you then, and you've got all these projects that really do need the pavements. These really do need them, too. Right. But then what happens that year when we have got $5.9 million for 17? The reality is you either keep grabbing an additional year forward, 
until we get to the full implementation of the state of good repair funds uh, or just some years will be less than others but again just <laughs> intuitively to me is the road isn't we have a road